looking. Yeah, we're still looking at it. Eventually, they'll get a letter. Oops. Anything else you want me to cover? We're getting out my hammer. No, it'll impact our 218 process and probably make a little more, a lot more work for me. <laughs> I'll call to order the special meeting of the Paradise Irrigation District Board of Directors this Wednesday, April 22nd at 6.31 p.m. I uh, would like to ask board members, <laughs> myself included, and public to uh, please silence your cell phones so that we don't get interrupted. And would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. George Ann, may we have the roll call, please? Oh, excuse me. Here. Here. President Here. Here. Present. Okay, in regard to the approval of the consent calendar, we're going to be pulling off item 2C uh, because some of the details have changed on that. Does anybody else have any items they want pulled off for further discussion? Yeah, in that case, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar with the removal of item 2C. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any approved? Any opposed? <laughs> None. It passes 5-0. We will come back to 12. Why don't we just hit 2C right now? We had a, a uh, <clears throat> an additional handout on that with revised uh, cost figures. I have a... Yes, yes. This is about cleaning out the tank. This is the demolition of the scrubber. The demolition of the scrubber. scrubber. I'm sorry. Right. And the only difference is that there's crystallized material at the bottom, which is. That's what be... caused the change order. Yeah. So, I mean, that's basically it, right? That's. Yes. The assumption was it was all liquid. Liquid. Exactly. How old was the tank? How old's the tank? Since the treatment. 90, went in. 1990. Yeah. 20 years old. I was thinking, yeah, so. Yeah. Not surprised, but. The, the change is about, in the board packet, the original cost estimate was an estimated change order cost. This is the actual final change order for the actual work performed. So, and because work was performed um, last Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday, so I made them provide the information for this board meeting knowing that you'd be ratifying. Jim, is it like taking concrete out of this thing? Or is it, it was. They used a backhoe with tiger teeth, if you know what they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fill the hose. Yeah, tiger I teeth. It was, uh, yes, it was very hard. It has to be disposed of differently. Yes, yeah. yeah, since they have to drum it. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a few extra drums, and then they thought, and a little extra liquid, and they have to go to a special facility, and it's quite costly for yeah. the solid. How, and many, how the, many years? Oh, pardon me. How many years did it take for that to build up? How many years? Probably twenty over a twenty-year period. Um, it was never, it never operated. Been, it's never been cleaned up. Well, it's never. Was it? Did it use, get used once? Well, it never ran. Test run. Test run, yeah. It hasn't been test run for years. Question. Jim, the, uh, the final cost was what? The total, uh, about 55000 No, I mean oh, the, oh, the change order. Change order um, cost. 16. 1633 Yes. Here. 16000 Bottom of the new handout. Is that this one? Yeah, I guess. I, I thought it was uh, twenty. So that's a different that different board different, board topic. different item <laughs> that's the award of the that's the disinfection system. that's the disinfection system that's another item coming up yes sir yeah. <laughs> the one we're talking about is removing that 20 years worth of accumulation 
and the chlorine gas scrubber to make way for our new bleach tank. Temporary location for our bleach tanks is where we're going to put. I'm just going to move to ratify approval of change order number one in the amount of $16,033.83 by the general manager for the removal of the unexpected solids in the scrubber storage tank. I'll second that. Okay, do we uh, have any public comments about this topic? I thought maybe I'd just go fishing and see. Any other board uh, comments, questions, fishing discussion? Was, fishing was Saturday. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Motion passes 5-0. All right. We're going to move into the uh, general public participation realm. This is the uh, time when public may <clears throat> talk about matters that are not scheduled on the agenda. And although the board cannot take any action on a matter not on the agenda, I'm uh, going to limit comments to five minutes per, per, per speaker. And uh, if there's anything that's on the agenda later on, we'll naturally have public comments for those as well. Any general public comments? Anybody want to speak to us at this time? No, we're going to move on to approval of the checks. Item number four, approval of the March checks. Um, we might as well just start with uh, Larry. With we'll let you have the whole menu. Larry. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't have too many this time. Oh, let's see. Where is the first one? Page 30. IBEW Local Union. Uh, the iPad page. Yeah, page 30. iPad, page 30. Okay. Bottom of the page. I'm sorry. 30. Um, is this, is this, do we do this bi monthly or is this two months in one month? No, it's safe. We do it each pay period then, yep. right? Every, each, every pay period, every yeah. Pay period. Right. I, did, I thought that was it. I just want to double check. So there's a second one on the next page. Right, yeah. right. Okay, on page 35, uh, Town of Paradise permits for the shop and the office. What are these? They're not a lot of money, but I was just wondering what permits we still have to get from the town. Those extensions for the uh, um, landscaping? No, it could be use permit fees. I mean, we have use permits for both properties uh, because we don't we do exactly that. use it to the zoning. So it's every year? Probably. Okay. And then on page 36, uh, who got the two new computers from Wayne Howe? The other one was for the new. No, I think the other one was Karen. I think Karen and the yeah, one. Yeah, right. yep. <coughs> they're both off. <laughs> were they pretty old? That their other ones or yeah. are these are these yeah, they, completely they were, different? They were, they were struggling with just the running of the accounting software. So um, yeah, okay. this time Laura had to restart her computer about three times a day. I do that all the time. <laughs> it's really efficient. Right. <laughs> okay, that's all I have. Doug, would you like to bring up any items? I'll go back to page three. I'm just curious for me. Uh, Perch equipment rental. I remember we bought you read one when we had that big blowout down at on the Pearson, if I remember correctly. We read the excavator then. That's Who's the vendor? Perch. 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 Oh, no, we page we page didn't three. rent an excavator then. Um, we rented it. This is rent for an excavator for the project on DeMille. Um, okay. By using an excavator, you can um, spin all the way around so we can keep trucks and keep one way traffic for the local traffic without having traffic control. Yeah. How it's come much it says faster shop? and stronger. It says shop on the description. It's because that's the department. That's the department. Oh, I didn't, I didn't oh, get up there while you were actually working on that. We're busy. We're going to let the lawyer pay for that, right? Because that's his street. <laughs> This is Doug's turn. <laughs> Did you use the uh, on the car, on the uh, Elliott pipeline breaker? Where, where did you say you used it at? I'm just we're using it on Demille on the pipeline project we're doing off of Demille. Okay, right, good. And uh, how many days is that, or how many hours? Three, three thousand dollars. 
I think that's a month. A month? Monthly fee. We get a really good break. That's, that is quite a break on that. When you Pretty consider nice that a new one's going to be a half a million dollars, it's better to rent them when we need or, them. I agree with you on that completely. <laughs> if we don't use them every repairs. Okay, going to page 35. I'm going to ask a couple of questions I was going to ask. Just curious. hundred and uh, It's for the U.S. Bank Trust. Interest payments, 101173 Is that uh, one of our loans? Yeah, that's, which, on, which that's on the 2009 Certificates of Participation for the uh, Automated Meter Reading Project. Meter? Yeah, that, so that's just, a, it was just an interest payment. So you pay, yeah, uh, right. pay principal during one time of the year and interest from one, down <clears> one time of the year. What do we pay principal on that? It varies based on uh, what what tranche of uh, bonds you're paying off, but the principal normally is, well, about three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars. We we're, we have about another five years, uh, not, not five five mil to pay on that, approximately. Uh, it's in it's in my report. I was tell you. Back here. Yeah. Is that just uh, going through this and trying to get a whole thing on the financial status uh, on page thirty seven, which is not the checks. Can I ask questions on that now? Sure. Page sure. thirty seven. Okay. And uh, all you guys do is go over here to the other page. This month is four hundred and forty-two thousand one hundred and sixty dollars. <throat> that came out of the general fund. Right. Now, for expenses, go to page thirty-eight. <clears throat> we have a general fund expense of uh, five million one hundred forty-three thousand. That's for nine months, right? The nine months were are it's we in nine months in our budget year? July first through March thirty-first. Yeah, so. Yep. Nine months. Okay. And uh, okay, Bill, do you have any items? Uh, yeah, last month we didn't receive an itemized bill yeah. on attorney fees, and there's is there itemized in the report? I'll get it for you. That's my fault. I'll print it off both at, months, please. Yeah, I'll print it off before uh, at break. And okay, get it to you. thank you. I other, other than that, I have no questions. Okay. Sep, do you have any items to bring up? Yeah, page 31, iPad page 31. Um, the vendor was Martin Crane and Rigging Incorporated. Yes. Well, what's that? What that part of the project is that? The offloading of the pilot plant. Power plant, okay. That's what I was thinking. Pilot. Pilot plant, yeah. That's it. Okay, the only question I'm going to ask is on iPad page 36 about the Yowzers Communication. It's a printing company. Apparently, we print up uh, several hundred passes, lake passes, <clears throat> lake and boat fee passes for the year. Uh, and it costs us $300 to do that. And I just want to, I don't really have any question about it. I just want to remind the board that we spend $300 to give people discounted passes to go to the, to the lake. Maybe we should consider adding that expense onto those, uh, onto that pass. There was 400 was the number that got printed. 400? So about 75 cents a, a card. Uh, I'll, t I'll entertain a motion on the approval of the checks. I'll make a motion to approve the March checks, general fund check numbers 47667 through 47749 for the month of March 2015, totaling $442,160.59, exclusive avoided check numbers 47686, 47694, 47732, <coughs> and authorize a similar amount allowing or adjusting for extraordinary budget or board approved items during the month of April 2015. Second. We have a first and second. Did the public have any comments about our check register? Any questions about checks from your perspective? No? Then we'll call for the question. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. It passes 5-0. I didn't vote. Didn't. Okay. Would you like to? No, I'll just make it 4-0. Okay. Four four. Four. I will listen for more noise yeah, from that so end you, of the you table. You need to listen more attentively. We, uh, the, uh, 
four and one, one abstention right. with Bill. The motion carries five zero. Then. <laughs> yep. Right. Uh, we're going to, we have no old business. We'll move to item number six, new business, the disinfection system improvement project for the water treatment plant. Manager Barber, would you please introduce this for us? Uh, since Jim was able to be here, I'm going to let Jim present it. He's, he's ground on the <laughs> wheels on the ground on this one. Which one is it? This one? Yeah, but it's been updated. Thank you, George. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to present this item because this really is one of the final steps and expenditures of transitioning from chlorine gas to bleach or sodium hypochlorite. Um, all the other expenditures have been dealt with, with by the board already. This is the last one, but maybe the most critical one because it uh, involved control of the bleach process. So we, we sent out RFPs. Um, you can see if you had a chance to look at it, it's pretty technical. Bill Taylor was the author of that. Um, we found four different companies that were capable, three bid, and I provided a summary of the bids on the attachment. There was one, one company, Tesco, that was absolutely not competitive on price or schedule. And then there was Sierra and Glenmont Global, which were competitive. Staff reviewed the proposals very carefully and determined that the low bidder personnel listed we were not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. They did not demonstrate the skills that we need. Um, consequently, uh, but however, um, Glenmont Global did. Um, they have people that have dem had worked on water projects and their proposal uh, provided an excellent work plan and detailed schedule. We were very pleased with, with their proposal. And so staff is recommending the second, high, second lowest bidder uh, Glenmont Global, uh, based on those reasons, a uh, project understanding. Um, the total, their, their actual cost is 19106 but I'm asking the board to approve $20,000 just in case there might be a minor change order, but give us a little extra room, which isn't much, but thought I'd round it up to $20,000. Um, okay, do we have any, any further questions? Or Jim? But as you mentioned earlier, this is getting us away from the gas, chlorine gas. Right. And into this. What was the Sierra's bid? Sierra's was the 14, uh, well, it's the 14,783, then plus the bonds, it's 15,226, the middle one. Here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 3,900 different. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. More. Less. Yes. Less. The, the, now, when we go to this new system, Jim, <clears throat> will we still have the. I had to doubt that dichloromethane. D the DCB heat. DC yeah. <laughs> the dichloromethane. Um, yes. That's really. Um, <clears throat> we. The chlorine. Chlorine is a stronger oxidant, can form more THMs or disinfection byproducts. So it's possible that we could, we could lower our that possibly until the process water project because it's not as uh, bleach is not as strong as oxidant as chlorine gas so. even, even though i was practicing how to pronounce that word and i should know that right and i do but i forgot the key thing here uh, but it could be lower this could be chlorobromomethane mm -hmm. could, could be lower possible we'll just have to run it and see right right but it'll be the safe that's, part. That's, that's not driving this product. That's a, by, that's a side, possibly a side benefit yeah. of, of changing. Yeah, this, this, what's driving this project is the safety part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. I understand that. So I'd like to move to authorize the general manager to execute an agreement with your firm that you're talking about not to exceed $20,000 for SCADA. 
integration of the disinfection system improvement project at the water treatment plant. That's what you were after. That's what you yeah. <coughs> Second it. Any further uh, discussion from board or questions for Jim? <clears throat> Just one more time. It'll be like the fourth time in my life. What does SCADA stand for again? Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Government I'm is sure great. I won't remember it again, but hey, it'll uh, uh, stick with me for a month or so. Actually, there's the supervisor that controls everything right there. But yeah. He, computers help him. That's <laughs> he, he tells the computers what to do. <laughs> the world Computer, is full yeah, of it's just the He gets all the credit. The, <laughs> the world is full of accidents. I have one more question, Jim. How many water treatment plants of our size or any size, as far as that goes, are still running on gas? Quite a number? I think there may be, because there's some very large plants that are staying on chlorine, I mean, there could be a quarter, 25% uh, to a third are still on chlorine <clears> gas. <throat> Predominantly, there's the change from, from gas to bleach has is is been a trend for a, quite many decades. Yeah. I did a little reading and study on this because you know, I'm interested in chemicals and pesticides and all that good stuff. And this is the only way to go to get away from it. The, you know, and a couple of the plants we looked at, you know, I would be traveling to get away from this. I've been trying to get away from you know, it for you know, 30 years. Your safety for our workers and for the general public in that area. Yes. The consequence of a chlorine leak is drastic. Chlorine gas leak would they're, be. You know, they're, they're not likely, but if they do occur, <clears throat> there's, um, it, in my last job with Ventura, they they had to shut down a chlorine gas leak and it was a bad day in the water department of city of Ventura. <laughs> I'll, bet, I'll, bet you, I'll bet you it was. If we had a leak, and hopefully we'll get it done, if we have that, we'd have the whole highway shut down up there and every <clears throat> hazardous waste rig in the country setting up there someplace. I'll bet you. <clears throat> There's many chlorine <laughs> facilities in residential communities and the fire department takes it pretty seriously when they respond. To chlorine gas. Yeah. Ken, did I add a comment? I, yes, go ahead. <clears throat> I have a friend who was down in Santa Cruz and worked for the water department there for years and got up to management. He still carries the wounds around from a chlorine leak that he was involved in in his 20s, you know, damage to his lungs. So. Yeah, Bleach is clean. not problem free, however. <laughs> just say that. Chlorine gas is probably worse. Just want to make it, I want to just share that with just you because we're talking family. about that. It's, there are issues, safety issues with bleach. It's just, it's not like taking a shower and yeah. it's open up. Would you say just less deadly? <laughs> less deadly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Do we have any, uh, <clears throat> any comments from public members about <clears throat> this? Yes, come on up and. I'm just wondering, is it a recurring cost? Uh, my name is Matt Del Fabe. Is it a recurring cost? Is there a recurring cost? Is this a recurring cost or is there a duration? Not once we switch if over, just the, the Just a one-shot deal? Just the bleach. Yeah. Yeah. Stay, once state is programmed, the skate. Uh, it's a one-shot deal. It's a one-shot deal. Thank you. Yeah. Any other public participation on this topic? If not, back to the board. Anything else for discussion? We're good. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Passes 5-0. I think I heard Bill on that one. Ken, uh, could my guest speak now? Possible. She just came. <clears throat> oh, she missed the... Um, Public comment period. Yeah. Lost in paradise is my excuse. She's from Chico. <laughs> um, She'll take exactly sure. five minutes. Okay, well, we'll time her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Toastmasters up here, and this morning she gave a talk on water <clears throat> wars, and I thought what she had to say would be interesting to the public and to the board members. And Loretta husband was a rice farmer for years, and she lived in Princeton. She's now a widow, and she's a very nice lady. Well, thank happen. you, and I'm also. I don't speak for them, but I have also been appointed to the Little Chico Creek advice, uh, representative to the, of the, to the advisory board of the water, Butte County Water Commission Advisory Committee. Oh Whack for short. It's kind of appropriate for me. Whack. 
Anyway, I just wanted to share, you're always timing me right now, I'm sure. Uh, I wanted to sh also to make sure you are aware that James Gallagher is having, we're trying to get bodies on Monday at the Capitol. If you don't know it, here, I'll give it to you after. Okay. Uh, well, someone here observed this morning that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And with this drought in California, it seems to be to ring soberingly true. After reading about Governor Brown's mandatory plans for the for defined use the city water companies and of course in turn their users if they don't cut back their use by 25 percent I began a journey into water conservation for the homeowner the average person and I'd like to share it with you all government plans seem to be they only have one solution higher costs lead to less use and I worry that ordinary ratepayers like me and you, who are going to see higher bills for less water, I think education has always proven to be a better answer along with incentives. My journey into the water conservation took me to Cal Waters offices. I'm sure you know who they are in Chico. Uh, my goal was to reduce water pressure at my shower in my home. It was going out, out, out when it hit me. I wanted that water to be less. I looked into this. I found this. The restrictor, the restrictor is a PSI, 2.5 PSI inside. It costs $49.95. Okay. When, Cal, when I talked to Cal Water, they say they, they gave me this. They said, if you will send this in, and we will give you a kit for free. But the PSI is 1.50. Oh, is 1.5. Five PSI. I wanted lower than that. So I, I had to go online. Five ninety five, no, five, excuse me, five five dollars and forty three cents from Amazon got me one point two five PSI at the at the um the joint the, the intake valve at the before I put the, the water the this thing on. Okay? Now, do you really think that every homeowner is gonna know be able to afford something like this to, to lower their use of water. And I, when I complained to them, Cal Waters rep at the window said, it's not up to us. We're, you know, it has to come down from corporate. So what I'm hoping for is because you aren't such a big water company that you can afford to do what I was just saying, education with incentives. I know you're not a privately held water company such as Cal Water, but I'm hoping to get you to offer vouchers in your bills when you send them out. Vouchers that give incentives to people to buy these water saving devices, thus lowering their bills. Even just as a simple insert uh, to add incentives like tips uh, will give you a reward for the best tip of the month. Uh, if inside the uh, inside the the bills, you can offer rewards also in a, a maybe a little uh, ad in the newspaper, the local newspaper. We California. Oh, oh! I forgot to tell you, I had a I caught the Cal Water guy as he was coming to my meter this last week, and he told me that and showed me where the water comes into my home, and I was told that we can't force people to have, have turned their, their water pressure down outside, not on their property, and we can't come on their property. But we can actually tell people they can go to, Cal Water can't do it, there is a meter that will turn down the water pressure where the, where the, the pipe goes into your home. You can have that installed, and a plumber will have to do it for a reasonable, he quoted me, reasonable fee. But Cal Water, of course, can't, and you, you also, this is a private needs to be told to the residents that they can turn it down it's five minutes no just yeah. to let you know though but it's you're oh, thank you. approaching it oh yes indeed and i'm almost there as a matter of fact uh we californians i believe can get through this drought and we can all work together and we will do our part but we just have to be given the facts and i think the education Holding a sword over our heads like the governor wants to do is not in the form of fines and water costs. It's not, it's not good enough. And my final say is 
Education coupled with incentives works on our pets and our children, and I believe it will, can work on California's water users. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for you your very time. Much. That very, was very just nice. about right to the last grain of sand. Oh, I was kind of <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to tell you, I went online to the spell. Okay, now very I nice. guess thank I you. will close that section of the public thank uh, you speaking. Much, thank you. For, yeah, that's, that's fine. Thank you for that information. Um, we are now moving to... New Business, 6B, Special District Leadership Foundation. Manager Barber? Yes, sir. I am very proud to uh, let the board and the public know that we received the uh, Special District Leadership Foundation's um, Transparency Certificate of Excellence. It was quite an effort, but it's a process that's established by the, the special district, there's a lot of people out there that want transparency in local government. And so they came up with a checklist of things that a district such as ours can do to prove to the public that we are indeed uh, transparent and actually excellent at it. So let me read to you some of the things we've gone through over the last year to make sure we complied this, with this. So we've got ethics training for board members. We comply with the Brown Act. We have a policy related to handling Public Records Act requests. Uh, we have an adoption of a reimbursement policy. So we have a very well-defined policy about reimbursement of expenses by board members and staff. We have our annual disclosure statements. We timely file our special <coughs> state controllers financial transaction reports, we conduct annual audits, we have current policies that address conflict of interest, code of ethics, financial reserves policies. Um, we maintain a district website with a laundry list of items that the public is interested in. Um, in fact, we, we cover almost everything on this list, but we cover enough to meet maybe even all of it. Um, we have a regular district newsletter and we communicate with our public. Uh, we communicate through press releases. We complete salary comparison and benchmarking for the district. Uh, and our, the most reputable salary survey now is the state controller. <laughs> um, we have special community engagement projects. We hold annual informational uh, budget hearings uh, to engage the public in adopting our budget. And we, um, that's, that's kind of the hit list. So it's quite an effort. Um, very proud that we're able to um, be presented with this, this, this certificate. Where is it, Georgie? I mean, it's in the board packet. We'll, we'll post it actually probably out by the, the front lobby rather than the boardroom where more people will see it. We're going to be nice friends. Yeah. Um, and with there, there's also a letter from Assemblyman Gallagher congratulating uh, the district and the board on this achievement. So just wanted to cover that. Why is it only good for two years? We have to re reprove ourselves. Yeah, you have to reprove yourself. Well, I was surprised <laughs> that it is good for two years. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a lot of effort. So. I'd like to and congratulate it, you and staff on it. Yeah, when did we start that. working on that, George? About a year ago. About a year ago. Yeah, excellent right. job. But a lot of that stuff we've done for years, too. A lot of it, but there was a lot of it that, you know, with the intern's help and getting the policy manual updated, that was a big part of it right there. Um, things like that that we needed to tick off. <clears throat> there was also a few things that weren't on the website that now are currently on the website. Um, like the, um, we, we now post reimbursements travel reimbursements for all employees. There's a list of travel reimbursements on there for the district so that the district knows that we're not just out having parties <coughs> on the district's time. Those Palm um, Spring trips? That's right. <laughs> um, there's a download of, I, I don't know if it was already on there, but the Public Records Request Act is now online and they can download that from, on there. So there's quite a few things that we're 
added to the website. That was the biggest thing because transparency, I think, is now the vision is through websites, through you know online application, and be able to get get information online. And so there was a lot added to the website to make sure that we conformed with the transparency. So we added that information to the web, to our website. Yes. <clears throat> and how is it? maintain or what's its shelf life like we put something up there then how long does it stay visible to the public before it becomes too cumbersome and we drop drop old stuff off um, we for for some of the stuff it would be a yearly basis uh -huh. so on a yearly basis we would do it um, some stuff would just stay on there until it's either updated or or it's no longer applicable yeah, I'm thinking about things like uh, expenses and expenditures. That's a, Those that's you drop off every 12 months or so. Okay. How, how many districts got this? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know the number of districts. That was that's a good question. They should look, make a list of the people who don't get yeah. it, <laughs> <laughs> like they do when people don't pay their taxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that information. I'm, uh, I'm proud to be part of the district that has such a uh, good policies and procedures in place and actually works with them and manages them and updates them. It's very nice. Um, Excellent job. Any other board comments on that? Then we will move on to item number seven, committee reports. These are informational items only, oral reports regarding their representation on commissions or committees. Uh, the first one uh, is Director Duncan with the Local Agency Formation Commission. Can you tell us <clears throat> if they did anything that might be germane to PID business? PID, we just we approved the budget for the 2015-16, uh, and I think there was like a 2% increase in the budget, which keeps it to a minimum. Uh, we had... Uh, Three extensions of service from the city of Chico, which is getting them in line with their nitrate problem. And uh, that's basically it for, for, for LAFCO. I also, one that isn't on here is the Butte County Special Districts was met before in March. And uh, we had an excellent speaker, <laughs> Dustin. Dustin was the speaker. <laughs> yes. And he got uh, a quorum. <laughs> Well, yeah, we didn't have a quorum, but didn't we? It sort of come up that we really aren't. Are we subject to the Brown Act? Y yeah, I think you are. We are, okay, because so, there were comments that we weren't at the meeting and there, but of course oh, we didn't. Well, do those any. were after I left. So it was. <laughs> okay. I don't know if it's Brown Act, but it is. There's bylaws you'd have to look at. Right. The uh, the Mike, <laughs> your former boss, is is always against LAFCO, you know, and so he he sort of speaks his mind there. Uh, you want to tell us, we, it's, you've given it to us before, but it was basically the... On the yeah, the uh, uh, South Feather Water and Power Agency, they hosted the meeting. They asked me to come speak on the uh, pending test claim on the uh, water conservation mandates. Uh, which uh, we'll be discussing again in the context of different mandates, conservation mandates later. But um, I thought it was a good speech. The, uh, the folks that hadn't heard that before I thought were interested and asked questions, a good give and take. And um, I think the next meeting is going to be here. Have you been notified yet? No, no, no. Maybe. That's why I said I think. You were probably supposed to let us know. You oh, no, they didn't tell you me. You volunteered. Because I was there as, as a LAFCO representative. We didn't have any of our representatives there. Now, I think that was the reason we didn't have a quorum, too. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Where were those missing people? Well, George had a legitimate. Well, you had another meeting, right? Yeah. I had a legitimate excuse also. My phone was turned off. <laughs> Your phone was turned off. <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to move to the Paradise Lake Recreation Committee. Directors Kellogg and Duncan, and direct, uh, Director Duncan, your chairperson there also. Right, okay, and that was, we, uh, of course, we're going to, some of the things we talked about, have we already approved the Jeep thing? Yeah, it was on the consent agenda, right? The Jeep. It was on the consent agenda, right. yes. Right, so the, that was the only action we took at the meeting. Um, <clears throat> let's see what we had. 
we had project updates and then we talked about kids fishing day and then of course it was last saturday and uh, uh I, how soon are we going to have a report on that does do you know jim Eight weeks a couple, weeks. couple of weeks we our next meeting is uh june, uh, june the second yeah. right and um that was the big thing and uh uh they uh were they're still doing money to raise to get fish on the uh recyclables collection day will be may may 2nd and 3rd and then the middle school is a continuing action all the time so if you uh want if you have any cans or uh is a glass also Middle school will probably, um, in beginning January, they'll do it every year. Right. For, for maybe a couple of weeks to a month, depending on the parents and how active they want to be. Um, ACE program is going to be every year. Um, this year, we just decided to do it after the kids' fishing day. Mm -hmm. um, the Paradise uh, Middle School collected $123. And we hope the ACE, last year the ACE program was about 700. Oh. Okay, you have anything to add, Bill? Yeah, on Kids Fishing Day, uh, Doug and I went up there together and we saw Larry, but Larry made sure we didn't talk about any business. And at <laughs> any rate, yeah, on the, we went to the other side of the lake. We were, stayed over where the concession stands are and, and uh, giving out prizes and everything then we went over the other side and while we were over there a woman had a stroke evidently and she and Jason was on the ball I got his name right right okay and called 911 and the fire engine came first and then an ambulance then the fire engine tried to go over because it was over at the last landing we have on the road and couldn't get through too many cars were parked on the road on both sides the ambulance could go through. Jason helped the fire engine men transfer their equipment for emergencies onto the pickup and seemed to do a really good job. He was on top of it. He drove a little fast, maybe in race and dust, but that's to be expected in an emergency, I guess. And so he helped him get over there. I don't know how it turned out or anything. We left before anybody came back over from the other side. The, thing I got out of it is we need to have some sort of road control on that road when we have people coming into parking somebody to help line out the parking for the cars don't park on both sides and there's enough room for a fire engine to get through there in case of an emergency that happened and I think it was taken care of all right but it took I guess from the time they called 9-11 or anything, it took about 20 minutes to get a fire engine there, which is actually pretty fast considering where that is. And, but that was the one thing I, I thought we need to do something about as a committee, not just a committee, but as a board on parking. And we used to have a man on the other side of the lake that helped with the parking there where we come in. And there didn't seem to be any problem over there. There was plenty of room to get through and so forth. It was just over on that one thing. If it had gone down to the landing or where, where we launched boats, there wouldn't have been any problem. There would have been plenty of room to get the firehouse, fire engine through. So, but uh, that's that was it. Thank you. Uh, the last one is the Water Conservation Committee. Directors Kellogg and Flesher. Director Flesher, you're the chairperson. Yes, thank you, Ken. We met on March the 5th and had several items on the agenda. One of the was we kicked off was with the de demonstration vegetable garden, which we've been working with because of, and holding on hold because of the drought. And I gave the report to them that we voted down as a board uh, a authorization of $2,000 for the initial expense of that. And I've been in complete favor as long as there's any kind of a drought, we would not even think about doing any type of activity of that. That's just my personal opinion. And uh, what we'll do is we'll maintain that portion up there as in a drought or a till, uh, uh, fire, uh, foul in fashion and mow the cover crop when it gets that time of the year, which will be either be next month at the latest, and it'll be fine on hold. And it looks very nice if you looked at it now. 
Yeah, that's a good way to go. And then we had an update by Jim on the water supply. Talked a little bit about Browns, and we talked <coughs> about the update of the PID resolution that we passed, implementing the water conservation program. And Tanya was there, and she discussed that. And then the big thing that came out of it was that we worked, and Jim gave an excellent presentation on it, the automatic shutoff water devices and the nozzle in shutoff devices. And after the discussion, it was felt that we should recommend to this board that we consider doing that as we did last year on the spray nozzle at the end of the hose. And so we moved to recommend to this board that we do that similar to last year and you approved it in the consent agenda. We didn't put any figures on it or anything. We just left that up to the board's discretion or the management or something. And that was on the uh, consent agenda. And in fact, one of the two devices are sitting over there on Kevin's desk. So you might want to hold those up. They went down already. And uh, Kellogg recommended that one a long, quite a while ago. And you want to talk about that one just real brief? Oh, what you do? I I use that at home. I have three or four of them. And it used to be before the drought. I haven't done it since now. And it, I'd leave a hose running, turn it on to water something, and I'd forget it. And the sprinkler would go all day, and then I'd come home and go, oh, geez, I left it on too long. Then I started getting those things, and they can you can dial in how long you want or even how much water. They're mechanical. They don't need a battery. And you can, if you're you come back and you think it did enough water, you can turn it off and it won't hurt the device at all. And I've never invested in sprinklers or shut off systems of that sort. We have just one for my wife's little garden. But that is, a, I thought that was something that people might invest in. And I noticed Jim did a good job of getting prices on them. And he got a, I thought a very, that's, I went to the Yesterday, I was at the hardware store and looked at them. They're $16 on the shelf, and Jim got them quoted at eight, I think. Is that right? Uh, $7.32. $7.32, even better. So that's the reason for recommending it. Um, the, the, the other end of the nozzle, uh, I got two of those from last year, and been having four each kids use them. And I've gone through about four by now, and I haven't lost one. And besides that, they're guaranteed for a lifetime. And Jim did a great job of picking those out. So if they break, where do we take them back to? Foothill or Foot Hills? Oh, yeah. Are they to, well, we don't. I think, I think they they all can. Wouldn't we only take them to Foothill? Oh, Foot Hill, but I see Ace this year is involved, <laughs> and they shouldn't ask you a question. They if, shouldn't. If it's broken, <laughs> you take it in there, and it'll give you a brand new one to walk right out the door. Even if they didn't sell it to you. As long as it's that thing there. Okay. Well, let me. I'm sorry. I don't, don't want you to have any information okay <laughs> uh, they changed the um, the warranty the warranty yeah kind of, <laughs> kind of. well this year this little Come thing on. this little thing he last year said um, was warranted lifetime warranty limited lifetime warranty it doesn't say that anymore. oh so, you're right if it breaks for normal wear and tear you take it you take this back and put it up and they look at it and go, yeah, okay, here's the new one. You take it with you. Oh. If you. If you drop it on the ground and under shock a little bit, they're going to know that there's tire strength. Tire strength. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm assuming they're there. not going to replace it. <laughs> this the, uh, this uh, one, Ace, you run this over and you drop it, you're not going to get a new one. Is that basically just like an egg timer? Yeah, so you just like it. You put it on and your faucet tick, 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 and the connects to it. Sticks back. Well, the, the reason yeah, the other yeah. the reason the other manufacturers break is because the kids drop them on concrete or whatever it happens to be. And if you drop that on concrete, but what you always want to do, because I do this with two different stores on hoses, you always take the tag off the thing and take it back right there, and you'll get it. I bought hoses from. You've got lots outfit. of tags around your house, don't you? Oh yeah, <laughs> I've got. I've been. I bought hoses from an outfit in Chico. I won't name their name. I used to go through three or four a year. I paid sixty bucks for a couple of hoses. I haven't bought one in eight years. Yeah, I'm surprised they let you back in the door. They welcome me with open arms <laughs> because instead of buying a hose, that's my favorite store. <laughs> All right. They sell out. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Our next meeting is yeah, right. June 4th. Second Thursday of the month. Oh, yours is. They're going to be at a discounted rate. The, uh, yeah. Yeah. We, we did that last year, and the, and the general manager and staff is going to be citing what, how they're going to right. notify public and make those available, and we're subsidizing that, getting it out to the public. It should be about you, half the cost. you any discussion, do you think about two like you did last year? About three. Yeah, it'll be a limit of two. So. Two uh, per meter? Two per account. Yeah. About four accounts, so I can get eight of them. 380. Uh, <laughs> Don't be reselling them on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> 16. Okay, anything else for the Water 10. Conservation Committee? The 12, whatever no, it's for the month. No. Watched quite well. Good deal. Did we run out of them last year? Yeah, really yeah. fast. Oh, yeah, they How went fast. How last year? 500. Yeah. How long did it take us to run out of them? A uh, month and a half. Yeah, I was going to say a little over a month. <laughs> they hit the newsletter and zip. People yeah. were lining up at the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, also, in uh, under the heading of committee reports, we have some board travel and business reports. Um, Director Flesher, <clears throat> would you please report on the California Water Management uh, Strategic Overview? Yeah, I'd be very happy. Too? It's in the uh, packet, and I asked uh, Georgiana to put it in. And the reason I'm reporting on it is because I build the uh, district out of my traveling budget, $35 or 10 And as you can see, it's coming up on the wall there. You passed uh, it. California Water Management is strategic. If you, I'm on the uh, Wastewater Committee for Butte County. And this was put on for public health and environmental health people. And it was kind of interesting. I had no idea what I was going to get into, but Dustin, this Gary Barnini. DWR? Yeah, he's number two guy one yeah. the, uh, in the state, right? Department of Water Resources. Water Resources is what I'm talking about. Okay. And how about Tom Hicks? The you know yeah, Tom? He's a, yeah, I know him. They both are excellent presenters, and then this Kate Williams. But they presented it from the standpoint of public health and environmental health. And they came out with a lot of different things. It was quite interesting, and you can see the judges we go down to here on this. And it was held at the Roll Country Casino. And one of the things that they mentioned, Brown hadn't put out any of his orders yet, or proclamations, or whatever you want to call them. But this Gary said that there was going to be some coming out. Pretty significant is the way he put it, you know, but he wouldn't uncork it until the governor put this out. And he said that they would be, the state, his agency, would be reluctant to change anything that the governor comes out with, which means they help the governor, right? Okay. And the reason he said that, and this is during his presentation, just because, and he actually pointed this out, not PID, but other places. If you have a dam that's blocking water, you don't own the water behind it. The people in the state of California own the water. And, you know, he pointed up the hill up here, but he wasn't pointing at us. I don't know what I was pointing at. But that's what they really feel. And he stressed that, so did this Tom Hicks. And, and, uh, and, Dustin, you and did you it? tell them that that's their opinion and we have a different <laughs> opinion? If you could believe this, Director Hunt, I sat there with my mouth closed. <laughs> Next time I'm going with you. <laughs> I'll encourage you. But they, they really meant that. And he also mentioned, that, you know, you're saving water and all of this type of stuff. If you, and you've said this more than once at these meetings here, that's what I keep pointing it to. If you don't use your allocation, you're going to lose it. And that's what he said, you know. So you had no problem hearing it. So it was quite interesting. Well, and at my table, there was four environmental health people and a couple of public health people from different counties all over, and two of them from down in the Central Valley, and the water district that they have serving there has four months worth of water. And when that four months is gone, they don't have any more source. There's no source. Yeah. So you can tell why this thing has gone wild. And, uh, but anyway, it was quite an interesting meeting, and I heard it from a different perspective. Thank you very much. Here you go. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> At the front of this brochure, go back one page. What's this reservoir that's dry? They keep showing it on the news. It's called the, the dry reservoir. Isn't that Oroville? <clears throat> no. Yeah. 
No, it's down in San Joaquin. Oh, is it down? Is that the San Luis Obispo? They keep showing one on the news. I keep seeing this one that's, 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 that's dead like Oroville cool. to me. Looks like Oroville. It looks, it looks like, like Oroville to me. South Fork? Yeah. 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 yeah, it's one of the upper branches. Yeah, yeah. yeah. South yeah. Fork, middle. Of course, that's a little better more. update. But the, at Biddle? the table that I was at, there was two environmental health people. One of them was the chief of his county, and I forgot the county was down south here. That they're within four months of being out of water, and they don't have any other source. It's just no source, you know. So it's kind of wild, really. We're well, so what are they saying? The, the land is going down a foot a year because of the. the yeah. 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 He it's gave so many years of burns. The ground is really. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, they had a geologist there that was giving a very, it was very interesting. I won't go back and get into it too. But talking about eons ago when uh, Yosemite was covered with ice and the ice started flowing out for eons, 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 that type of thing like that. And I had the offer to go manage a farm down in the Central Valley out of Fresno. And at that time they were pumping at 50 feet. That's where the bowls were set. Bowls are the stuff that pump it up. So they were pumping at 50 feet. Now they're at about 250 feet to try to pump it up. And what happened when that came down, he had an interesting of saying it, you know, there was just water running up and the Central Valley was basically full. And we we're taking it out, you know. And it's gone down in the last six years, the groundwater down there is, uh, is receded. And we're talking about the whole Central Valley over a foot a year going down. And Dustin's has got more current knowledge on this this type of thing than, than I do. And he also mentioned, one of the, one of the presenters, I, forgot, I don't think it was Gary here, he, he was the longest presenter. They're really wrestling what to do with groundwater. They are really wrestling what to do with groundwater. And one of the biggest factors, being a farmer, you'll own 100 acres of walnuts or whatever it is. And out of that 100 acres, annually you pull 500 acre foot of water out of the ground, you see. So if you're using five acre feet per Hundred acre for acre, so it's kind of interesting. So it's a real wrestling match that we're going into. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a little confused on the next two topics. Are they related, Director Kellogg? Uh, actually, they are, but they're not either. Too. So those. And are then I requested two different areas. I requested 15 minutes for the first one and up to 25 minutes for the second one. It didn't get on the agenda, but anyway, so you so you won't gavel me down. And hopefully it won't take that long. I went down to the San Joaquin Valley to the San Luis Wildlife Area for meetings. Uh, for morning we had a tour of uh, all the different wetlands in the river. And it was amazing. The San Joaquin River goes through this wetlands. And it, <laughs> you could almost walk across it. it. It was maybe 20 feet and 2 feet deep and the middle of this wetlands and they take water out of it and other places and then the afternoon was with all the different managers of the different wetlands and the fellow from Ray Lodge was there who I know and then people from all over the San Luis I'll show you the map as best you can see is down here now it's rated as the second largest wetlands managed area in the United States it's behind the Florida Everglades in size. I didn't even know the thing was that big or had all to do. It goes, the people that represented in the afternoon and gave part of the program, which lasted to almost five o'clock, with two members of the water board there and their support staff. We only had one attorney, although one of the Gray Lodge fellows pointed out that they had 24 on staff now and he didn't appreciate it, all the paperwork. So, and I think George is in the same position there. So, here, so it says Upper Butte Basin, Gray Lodge, Butte Sink, and it was down there. I stayed in, uh, oh, and I uh, bed and breakfast, and it was out here first thing in the morning. They have a beautiful building, it's federal money, it's uh, built very beautiful. There are all sorts of displays. Inside, there was displays on honey, and so forth. What I really didn't know until I went is the managed wetlands is defined as managing wetlands for wildlife, birds, game, all sorts of things. They also have tule elk there, mountain lions, deer, and et cetera. So as we went through the program, it was interesting to pick up things in it. Now a managed wetland, they have canals that feed them uh, 
drain water from the different irrigation districts that come into this thing. They have, I think it's eight different government agencies, including an RCD that specializes in managing 40,000 acres of this wetland. They have a minimum staff for all of this and minimum budgets, and they're out of water. They're having a terrible time managing the water. Their biggest fear is that the water board will decide that there's no spill out of agricultural use because they use the drain water. Now, the one part about this I thought you might find interesting is part of the federal wildlife is the Ketterson. Now, I don't know if you all remember, oh, 10 years ago or more, there was a die-off of birds in Ketterson from salinity, you know, it was from serpentine rocks or what we call a chemical, it's not serpentine. Asbestos? No, not asbestos, it's actually, a, we, um, it's a poisonous arsenic. Arsenic? No, no not arsenic. Selenium. Selenium, that's it. That's Selenium. It. And they killed off a massive amount of birds and they didn't know what to do. They had to okay to continue the canal all the way down into the delta. We're up to the wall down there. Well, they have to get used to the water <coughs> in that part of the valley. They went in and capped it with soil and everything. Then they continued to have this bad water coming and they turned it into a wetlands. And they're actually producing water out of the end of it without any poison. The wetlands have cured the problem. They're not having birds die off and so forth. So an unusual use of managed wetlands, because they do manage it. They change flows, they mix water, salinity water with fresh water and everything else to maintain the, this massive wetlands. And most, about a third of its wetlands in it. And what I picked up out of it was all sorts of information about how they're managing it and what they're doing and how wetlands like that can function, especially in a year of short water. And we saw very little wildlife because most everything was dried up and the birds had gone. They're in the Central Valley flyway with their problems. And we did see salts on the surface and they had places where the salts actually came up and out in the middle of nowhere. And they were doing a valiant managing job to provide feed and cover and so forth for all these birds. So I will show you a couple more maps. And then mention one fellow I met there. And these are some of the actually wildlife stations in California. Describes them all, including the ones up here. And as a map, you can see how they extend all the way down. And that's because that's where the birds fly in the winter. And all of them are pretty well dedicated the same way to the birds. We found a little, I've done a little bit of different with the CWA, which is California Waterfowl Association, on the Gray Lodge or nearby with seedings of different things that they've never used down in the in this San Luis National Wildlife Refuge complex. So this is on that, and they, here's, if you like birds, pictures and stuff, beautiful things. These things are all free, of course. Refuge, flyways, migratory, wild, waterfowl was the main thing. And when they got into the issues of each of these managers talking, they were talking about the problems that they each had within their managed wetlands and their present uh, their uh, wetlands. I keep doing that, I should say, managing the wildlife and everything. And they've uh, formed an association for financing. It's a loose coalition between all these different agencies, and they're all working together on this multiple things. There didn't seem to be any fights over anything. They seem to be working together, working and talking shop together. The most complaints they had, not at the meeting, but on the tour was the board. They kept referring to the board and the frustration of dealing with them with the 24 attorneys, Dustin. So you're outnumbered. I know. <laughs> and so let's see if there's something else I forgot on this. They agree just outstandingly high, 90,000, 40,000 acres managed by these different groups. Lots of private land involved with uh, easements for wildlife management. Lots of duck clubs, sort of like Gray Lodge in that way. And 
the interesting thing. One of the things that happened, I asked them at the end of the meeting about what's the difference between a constructed wetland and a managed wetland. And there are two different critters all together. But a fellow came up to me after the meeting was over and I was getting ready to go home, gave me his business card, and it's Clint E. Snyder, Assistant Executive Officer in Reading. He runs the Reading office for the Regional Water Quality Board. He's the chief executive. And he told me if there's any kind of help that we need, he'd be glad to provide it about wetlands. If there are any questions about that, then I'll go to the constructed wetlands. Anybody have a question or a thought? Yes, George. In that presentation, did they talk about, <clears throat> I've been reading a lot about the federal government changing the Clean Water Act and its impact, potential impact of this legislation on wetlands <coughs> becoming waters of the U.S. Did they cover that at all? Well, ag people are fighting that extension of power over uh, water rights by two government agencies. And they didn't talk about much. They were there to get the feeling of these managers about increased regulations. And the gal that worked for the water board got up at the very end, summarized things, and said there's four ways we can go. And one was no more regulations, leave it the way it is. The other two or three of them had different things. And she felt that those each of the three increased regulations wouldn't, what I'd call, hold water, that they uh, probably shouldn't be considered. The members of the board, the chairman of the meeting, asked that she present to the board a summary of a report later on. So this is how important it is we get along with the staff at these different agencies, because they're the ones that are going to recommend to the board and provide the information to them. And so you, you've got to be cordial, nice, and, and try to influence them a little bit. And it, because I, I'm sure we're going to have a mess of lawsuits. The one story I picked up from a friend of mine in the seed business, the first day I did seed business, and he told me about a water districts, two water districts that are outside of uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, outside of uh, Manteca. And the Fish and Wildlife Service came to him and said, we want 15,000 acre feet out of your reservoir. And the two districts got together and said, we're not giving you anything. We don't care what you said. Take us to court, do whatever you want, but we're not giving up any of our water. And so they sat down and had a nice talk, and they gave up 1,500 acre feet to them, which they still weren't happy about doing. But it does show you that the regulators can be talked down, stood up to whatever way you want to put it if it's necessary. I'll talk about the construction. It, that, that didn't sound like they were being nice. When they just said you aren't getting any. <laughs> okay, I like that. But what I didn't quite understand was, was this. Um, this sounds to me like it's just something that was built for wildlife and refuge and wetlands and a place for wild animals and critters to slither and fly yeah, into. Part of it is used for grazing. There's honey clubs, private honey clubs interspersed all around this and inside of it because there's private lands that are inside of it. Some of its acreages, figures I have, is on private land and leases. So it's a rather complex thing they're doing with oh. these agencies and everything. The okay. goal is wildlife terminal, but they do have some farming and grazing. At least it was interesting. The federal lands allow grazing and regulated, and the state won't allow grazing on their properties. And the state's lands are called grassland and no grazing. So okay, well. I, I don't see how it's tied to our water district stuff, but maybe it'll come up with the next, well, next one. Well, it's tied the basic thing that the wetlands accomplish taking salts out of the water. When the water leaves, whatever water leaves this wetlands or this huge wildlife area, it's clean. They can go back into the river. That's like Ketterson. They took the poison out. They're not killing any more birds there, but they didn't have to build a huge mechanical field. They use the wetlands to get the poison out of the water. And they're not accumulating it either. They don't know what's going on exactly. It's magical. And I'll probably use that word again because there's a lot we don't understand about wetlands except the word. And so that's what was coming out of it primarily. Okay. But what was going in? Did they have DCBM? They had salt water coming in. They had water. We stood by one of their concrete canals. 
that was coming in from water, and it wasn't the best color in the world, and they were going to be mixing it. They take water samples from all their water sources, especially the, the one that has RCD in it, the Resource Conservation District, and they use those samples to mix the waters. We did the best job they can for the wetlands. It was interesting, around the wetlands themselves and in the river, you didn't see any salty plants. But in some of them, when the salts are high, they let the, the plants that are invasive species came from here originally, but they let them grow or feed for the birds and the wild. So it's a very complex thing what they're doing and are continuing to do. I think they're doing an excellent job with the amount of staff they have. So. Ken, this is this is ag tailwater, right? Yeah, ag that, that's ag what? Kill? Agricultural tailwater. Tail? Tail. Yeah. What's so? What yeah, happens is ag. they pump water from the delta, which is a little more salty to begin with. They irrigate in like Westlands Water District, which leaches the salty soil, so it pulls additional salt out, and there's boron too. And then that goes downhill, and they capture it, and then they run it through this. This gr grassland bypass. And that's how they clean it up for it to go back into the river. But how many acres do they have to have? 130,000 is how many. Like. <laughs> well, we don't have that much. More than we? that. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, uh, my main concern was about our whatever you call it, DCBM. I just wrote the initials down. It's a lot easier. I'll talk about that in a Because it. All right. Um, oh, Ray Lodge was involved. The manager there captured rainwater in December from the big storm. And by rules, he was supposed to let it out, but he hasn't because that's all the water he's got. And he's scared to death that we won't get any tail water into the refuge and drain the wash. It's not his food. It's a lot of birds. Well, you don't care. need to sit down unless you're just going no, back to reload. So you're going to move into the constructed wetlands. Yeah, the constructed wetlands. Yeah. This is the research, some of it. I threw duplicates out today and got it down just to this pile of information I've collected the last, it have been a year, I guess. And the one thing this has done is really educate me. When I started out, I really didn't know much about wetlands or anything with it. And I got to thank the staff in a way by turning me down on things. So then I had to go back to work and find more information. The, I want to explain a little bit about myself. I usually don't do this, but I think it is to make you understand where I'm coming from on this. I'm educated at Chico State, and I graduated with a degree in agriculture and animal husband. I've been working in the seed industry for well over 40 years. I carry titles as agronomist, livestock specialist, uh, know how to turn cattle and work cattle without any noise and quietly. I do. Uh, consulting or I go in and view a livestock operation, check their grasses and everything, identify them. Few people can do that and help them develop a program for their grazing and what kind of seeding and so forth they should do. I had a half a year of biology after I graduated from Chico State. And there wasn't many jobs in ag, so I went back for six months with a family and got through graduate studies for six months in biology, took a bunch of biology classes. One of them that was interesting was ecology, and in those days, how old I am, it was not a buzzword, believe me. Nobody knew what it was, and we were sort of wondering ourselves. It was a new science or part of botany, and looking at everything in a uh, holistic manner, that word's really been used since then. So that's my background, helping others, and I work outside all the time, so that's why I'll say things about sweat storms and rain coming, because I've been outside when the rains come. And I went up to a ranch and looked at it with a realtor one time, made a couple hundred bucks for a consulting fee. And I told him, sitting in the little shed where we were just talking, I said, it's going to rain in a half hour. The storms are coming. And he sort of looked at me like I was crazy. Half an hour later, thunderstorms hit. We, all, we just sat in there and listened to it hit the roof, the hail and everything. So that, just to understand what my interest is in this, I'm aware that most of our staff has no biology background, and it's a problem, I think, for us as a district. So constructed wetlands. What I'm finding out is 
that the problems we have with pollution, the NPDES permit, that's a national pollution, what is it, rest of it, Jim? Discharge. Discharge. And elimination. And elimination system. And we have to meet two particular problems. We have aluminum and, I'm not like Doug, I can't pronounce that thing off. DCBM, just. Uh, nice long thing. DCBM. Yeah. So what I've discovered is the DCBM can be controlled with a simple thing as fountains or a water pump. It has a very short half-life. It'll volatize off. It'll be gone. The complaint about spending a couple hundred dollars proved it. It didn't prove anything about the aluminum, but it did prove we could get rid of the DPS pretty quickly. But since then, I've worked very hard trying to find sources of information on aluminum. And I finally have found some sources that have information on how to deal with the byproduct from our treatment plant. The, what do we call that, the name for it? It's the wash water or wastewater. wastewater out of the treatment plant that is high in aluminum. And we, in our ponds, we haven't been able to take it out. It's too high. Most of the time we get it out, but we actually break the rules every once in a while. So after all of that and, and doing all these different things, and having all these information, this is a thing on technical notes. All it talks is about is water-loving plants that can go into wetlands. Describes them in detail. This is a removal of aluminum in filter backwash water, a treatment organization case. All sorts of solutions are, are discussed in it. It was a master thesis for a young lady in Canada. I talked to Jim Bays, who's with uh, one of the engineering firms, and he told me about the DCBM, or whatever you want to call it, stuff can be broken and gotten rid of very quickly, and so forth. Then I did some math today, maybe not the best at what I do, and I called uh, Bill, and he gave me how much water was coming out of the treatment plant, because I couldn't find it. I'm sure I have it somewhere on my stuff, but I didn't find it. So here's my idea on this thing. We work with the NPDES permit because we can meet the aluminum and the, the other products rates that are requested that we meet by the water board. We don't need to put in a multi-million dollar treatment plant that we're on the verge of doing. And going through all of these things, I, I have one time after another, people were faced with the same situation we find ourselves faced with right now. And in the end, they went with the wetlands because it cost a third of the money that the mechanical thing did and everything. Now this wetlands is a true wetlands. It's not what we've had in previous proposals. It is actually a working thing. Uh, they, had a little, they have a little formula, which I went through, and it says, okay, we want it one to three feet deep is all. Uh, it can be, and I did the calculations on how much of an area we need, and it'd be three acres. Now, you might want to double it to six acres because of vice, but the three acres would handle the water even up to, that you're putting up there now, the 8% that goes up to the ponds, it, it would handle all of that water for one day. So if you wanted two days, you could put it six acres in. And you can put them in as different flat with a three to 5% slope for the water will move through. You have plants working on the top, but you have no plastic bottom in it. The soils up there are very permeable that means the water will flow through them. This is ag coming back because we are very concerned with this in agriculture and growing different crops. And the thing, and I have a letter here that I got from people in uh, Reading about testing. Yeah. And it says Paradise Water Treatment Plant Aluminum Monitoring Requirement. But the people that test for the NPDES yes, or whatever. Yes, they're the ones that run the permit. The girl that was here. Yeah, the girl was here, and her boss was a guy who went down. Doug is what they see on the list. You don't get one. I'll the share. Staff I'm going to 
will read it out loud. Mr. Kellogg, in response to your recent inquiry as to whether the Water Board is concerned enough about aluminum in the soil in our treatment ponds or not. This is the second person I talked to up there. The first person wanted me to hire a civil engineer to give results, and I wrote back to him, and finally I got this lady, and this is what she wrote back. The facility's NPDES permit requires monitoring of the facility's solid, i.e. sludge. Solids accumulate in the facility's treatment ponds i.e. settling ponds, which we have now. The NPDES permit states that the pond solids, when removed from the settling basins, shall be monitored as following. A representation characteristic of the sludge, qu sludge quality, including sludge percent solids and quantitative results of the chemical analysis for Title 22 metals and aluminum annually, sampling not required during years when solids are not removed from the ponds. Therefore, aluminum monitoring of the solids taken from the pond is required. The soil in the treatment ponds, in fact, deposited solids from the settling process. Then yes, when these solids are removed from your ponds, they must be characterized in accordance with the facility's NPDES permit monitoring requirement, which includes aluminum. NPDES permit does not require aluminum monitoring of the native soil or fill used in the constructing of the settling Ponds. This is the part that I, was very important to me to find out. We don't have to drill test holes around the ponds to check on aluminum. They are not interested in it at all. All they want is what's coming out of that pipe in the ponds. If you have any further questions regarding facilities NPDES permit, please contact us. For reference, the facilities NPDES permit, including the monitoring and reporting program, can be caught at and they give an address. Yes, George. I just want to clarify, Bill, that the um, drilling that we've talked about in the past, that was for groundwater testing to make sure that it wasn't impacting the groundwater. It wasn't testing the soils itself. Okay. Um, we thought there was a question in that, Doug and I, so that's why I went to this, to doing it. So we have, these are ponds that are one to three feet, most of them around two feet. They're used with packed soils. They don't have uh, a plastic thing underneath them. And it's called uh, free FW, free so something, wetlands. Free surface water. Free surface water, thank you. And these, so they're about this deep. You can make them in any kind of shape. If, if they can follow the contour of the land. They don't have to be a rectangle or a a pie shaped or anything like that. In other words, they follow the team. They claim all through this stuff that you don't need a well-trained person to run it. What's your certification, Jim? For well, grade five. Grade five. And, and Bill? Grade five and a grade two. Yes, and this, they're very proud of it, and they should be. They passed all sorts of tests, and they're qualified to run the treatment plant. But we don't need that qualification to run wetlands. The, and they say the management of them is key, but there is upkeep on them. I estimate the cost of this would be, I don't think it'd run three million, I think it'd run about two million, but that decides how big the wetlands should be. There should be an engineering firm to look after this. I'm certainly not qualified other than doing some guest estimates out of some old formulas that they have published. But we should have somebody looking into it that is trained in wetlands. Uh, our present engineering firm is not. And they made that pretty pointed when they actually came here and made presentations and got $25,000 from us in fees. But they need to be firms that have actually built or managed wetlands and we should look at it. Now, I'm gonna type this up in a more formal manner and make it public and actually push in the public through all different people that were willing to listen, including college professors and what have you, to get this wetlands off the ground. Um, and I will continue, to, when I need to speak to the, to the board, I will make an appointment like I did tonight. And I thank you for listening, but at this time, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Good. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Okay. Yeah, good. good. Well, thanks, Dan. Yes, sir. Are we aware of any other communities that have used this? 
Uh, they're used outside of uh, Chico, outside their sewage operation. They have a, they don't call them wetlands, but they have an operation there. One of the things the wetlands do, as one reason I wanted to go down to the managed wetlands, is that they attract birds and game because of the water. There's also, I know Ken brought up an issue of mosquitoes. There's also mosquito fish used and other things to keep the mosquito down and not to control the diseases. So should, with their should, Stockton, Chico, there's a whole <laughs> rank of them. There's actually one wet or uh, one company. Bill, we should clarify though that there's no wetlands being used to get rid of aluminum. Yes, there are. There you is. didn't listen to me. Part of the presentation is there is a, a master's thing and she sorts on uh, different wetlands who have, have done different processes to get rid of aluminum. That it is actually there, Seth. In California? In California, no, it was in Canada. But I have another one for you. This is California. And one of the things that the engineering firm came up said, no e experimental thing. Well, they're actually, um, let's see if I get the right agency here. This is a firm, oh, district actually, in Southern California. And they have been running experiments on wetlands for over 20 years. And they have installed wetlands in their own processing and everything. And they've tried all sorts of different things. And they report on modeling wetland nutrient dynamics, uh, effects of vegetation management strategy on vegetation establishment, water quality, Hemet is the town it's in, research cells, and they talk about all the different work they've done in California. Fate and transport indication, microorganism in constructed wetlands, nitrogen removal, investigation of nitrogen transformation in Southern California, because a lot of these wetlands are being used at, uh, at the end of sewage plants, and they do what they call dressing it up, the water, but they're removing things much worse than we are contending with here out of the water into their wetlands. And Chico is one, they call it ponds. I think everybody when they installed them was afraid of EPA, if they called it a wetland, they would make it permanent. That's why you always wanna use the name constructed wetlands or constructed treatment wetlands. You don't use <laughs> any other words for them. The EPA actually put it in their information to please do that for they don't have any enforcement problems on it. Any other questions? Is there any water districts that are using this in California? For potable water, there are water districts using it. Um, one district in Southern California that has 25 acres of wetlands actually diverts it from the dam they have because of accumulation of all sorts of products in it, petroleum and what have you. And they'll run it through their 25 acres of wetland and then drop it back in a river where it's, you, it's going to their water plant out of the river. So that's in California. Well, the thing I've heard is, and I'm talking about sewage, in uh, in Oroville, they have their water that they get through their septic systems, I mean through their sewer systems, it has to be cleaner than the water you buy in the store. Yeah, it probably does. Right, so I somehow I just can't see that we could do that. I don't know. That's oh, I've it, I've never heard of anyone doing it in a water district. I've well, I'll be glad I, see to, wetlands I'll wetlands that are sewer sewers. See the plants need some nutrients. There's not a lot of nutrients in our water that we w put back into the reservoir. Is there? I'm not a plant guy. There's no, bio, there's no biodegradable <laughs> there's, nutrients. Yeah, there's not, and see the, and as I always understood wetlands needed sewage in order to no, survive. No, not at all. Or, what you're after is the micro, that I mentioned magical earlier. It, you're after all the micro in the pores in the organisms, that one sheet I showed on plants, mm -hmm. describes all the different plants you use depending on the climate and what you want to take out with the wetlands. So the key to it is micro, organisms, the plants themselves, the water-loving plants, that will pull the nutrients out or pull the poisons out or whatever in the wetlands. And that's how wetlands, natural wetlands, clean up everything. And then over time, they accumulate an organic matter of the duff. If it gets to the point where it's too thick and slows down the action of the wetland, 
then you can dry it up. In one case at Hemet, they did experiments with fire, cleaning up the wetland, and then went back in and changed the design because they wanted it to do a better job than it had been done. So th there's lots of work. In, in England, they actually have a wetland organization, society. They have a month. It's actually May. It's a wetland month. Uh, I don't know why the English they get so much water and need all this. But at any rate, there, there's all sorts of information around the world. Some of these reports came from Saudi Arabia. Some of them came from Australia. It, this wetlands used in our particular thing is one part of engineering that is growing very rapidly. And because more and more of them are being used throughout the country. And, and problems that we're running into, we don't see, in my opinion, we don't have the money. And we're going to go out and borrow a slew of money. We're not going to have a way to pay it back is that a wetlands would be a way out and if it works it would save a lot of money to the district and do the job and even make <coughs> our requirements would be less so at any rate all right thank you bill uh, we're gonna i'm gonna move the uh, few things around in the agenda but first i wanted to ask public a question we have item number 14 which is the open session uh, in regard to discussing uh, about the State Water Board mandatory, mandatory urban water conservation proposed regulatory framework and on and on. So do we have public members that are here for that? Because if we do, right after this little break, I'm going to bring that up. Uh, we can get public input and then later on at the end of the session when we're ready to go into closed session for our legal discussion about it, we'll have public input without making you stay around here for another two hours. So that satisfactory, we're gonna take a five minute break. <clears throat> I'll call us back into session from our adjournment at uh, 8, 10 p.m. We're gonna move to item number 14, the open session. Uh, are we gonna be introduced um, this with you, George, or with we going right to the high-powered, high-expensive guy over we there? We might as well use the guy we paid for, and then I'll <laughs> chime in. Okay. Uh, so you'll recall at our special meeting on April 1, we were all kind of scramb scrambling, speculating, because on that same day as the board meeting, the governor had issued an executive order um, setting forth some uh, pretty specific urban water conservation requirements. Uh, fast forward to maybe April 10th or so, the Water Board published a draft regulatory framework. So how they were going to implement the governor's mandate in, in the most, the, the, this one catching all the attention um, is the mandate to achieve 25% uh, reduction using 2013 as a baseline. Um, I uh, worked with the district staff uh, to prepare comments. The water board staff wanted comments to their draft regulatory framework. So regulatory framework is just kind of these, these are our concepts. This is what we're thinking. Um, it wasn't actual regulatory language at that point. So what you have there on your screen is our comment letter. And um, would you mind going to the, the previous page? Okay, so let's just briefly walk through this. Um, the, the first point there, I wanted to encourage the Water Board to recognize that uh, Paradise Irrigation District and its customers were one of the few um, urban water suppliers in California that answered the governor's call for a voluntary 20% reduction. Um, and I thought it was kind of a, an equity argument listen state if you've got a high achiever as you do in the district um, the, uh, somebody that voluntarily did 20 percent you ought not to penalize the district and in particular the district's customers by imposing what at that time was a 35 percent mandate um, <clears throat> so let me back up and explain that a little bit the the draft regulatory framework uh, proposed kind of a sliding scale not every agency was in a 25% tier. They proposed four tiers and there they are. Um, so it went from 10% up to 35% based on September 2014 residential gallons per capita per day usage. Um, and of course, uh, in our area of California, 
September is typically one of the hotter months of the year, no rain. Um, we have a pretty high uh, water usage for the month of September. As compared to like a coastal climate that's not only do they have a cooler climate with uh, lower ET rates, evapotranspiration rates, but they also tend to have uh, smaller lots, denser populations. So it's, it's that RGPCD is not a really good indicator of efficient water use. So would you mind going back, George, to the comment letter? Thank you. So the uh, one down, there you go, um, which is actually the second point there. Uh, we <clears throat> submitted a comment saying this RGPCD is really not a fair standard to use. And <laughs> just, just so they, you know, they, they tend not to believe districts or lawyers. So I quoted language that actually the state uses on its own website. And it's, it's in the, uh, the block quote there. It is not appropriate to use RGPCD water use data for comparisons across water suppliers unless. Well, go to the next page, Kevin. So they're using it. They're not even following their own guidelines and they're proposing to use it. They acknowledge that climate differences, population growth, density, uh, economic indicators, and pricing, all of those tend to go together. And, and unless you normalize those, adjust them, then that, that uh, residential gallons per person per day is not a very good uh, use. Um, next page, Kevin. They even say water prices influence that. Okay, uh, the third comment there is uh, one that I think is significant. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, 2008, maybe nine, when the town of Paradise was evacuated, portions of it twice, uh, due to wildfire risk. And there's uh, code provisions in um, our statutes in this state that uh, impose very specific requirements on outdoor landscape for uh, fire mitigation and, and um, defensible space and those types of things. Um, and if you impose a 35, what at that, at that time was a 35% reduction on the district, that puts us in stage four of the urban water management plan, which basically bans all outdoor uh, irrigation. Um, the district staff believes that's necessary to achieve that level of a reduction. And when you have, um, you know, the hot summer months with no outdoor irrigation, you're just um, inviting a potential for wildfire. So we commented on that. Um, and then four and five, I think five, four is kind of self-explanatory. Five, I thought, you know, the water board, this is also getting a lot of press. They they are uh, authorized to impose uh, substantial fines for failing to achieve the mandated conservation. And um, would you mind going to the next page, Kevin? Um, the comment is, you really ought not to impose fines. You, you, if, to the extent you do, it ought to be kind of a progressive discipline. You start out with kind of an informal notice, then you elevate it to maybe a, a written notice without any kind of financial penalty and you tear up and, and the worst offenders, the, the, the districts that may be just thumbing their nose at the water board, then that's where you potentially get to the uh, substantial penalties. Um, so that, that was our comment letter on the draft uh, regulatory framework and we submitted it on April 13th. Um, on Saturday, last Saturday, we received the first draft of the actual regulations and the copy is uh, before you, I believe. That's not there on the board. This, this. Oh, this one, yep. So, <laughs> good and bad. Uh, okay, the good is the, the Water Board uh, staff incorporated some flexibility into the regulations. It allows, uh, arguably allows some suppliers like PID to um, at least argue that they're, they should be in a lower tier. So, so the good is that there's kind of some flexibility built in. The bad is that we went from 35% to 36%. Um, Which is what they put on the news the other night. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. 
Um, they are really stuck on this uh, residential per capita per day approach. Um, so I've, I've kind of concluded we're never going to move them off of that. So um, that's where we stand today. Um, to uh, kind of st take a step back, these are still draft at this point. So uh, we have a, another comment letter uh, that needs to be submitted tonight. And we're hoping to get some board and public input on the final product uh, before we submit it. Um, so the overall strategy at this point is still to try to shape the regulations to uh, a final product that maybe we can work with. Um, and then uh, the water board will, the, the board members themselves will consider this at the May 5th, possibly May 6th uh, water board meeting. And uh, if they are adopted, then they will go into effect June 1. So June 1, you will, uh, we will need to begin meeting whatever applicable conservation standard there is at that time. And I'm hopeful there's um, a couple pretty good arguments we have. And let's, I won't get into the legal arguments. I, uh, other than to say, I think we have plenty of legal arguments uh, if necessary. Um, but I think there's currently pretty good um, arguments we have that we ought not to fit within the 36 percent. There's we fit within kind of the the built-in flexibility that the regulations currently provide uh, that uh, would allow us to be in a lower um, conservation tier. So you want anything, George? Yeah, I'll add a couple observations. <clears throat> There's been conference calls and. Neil's been involved in some of them. Um, clarification, when they ask for 36%, um, the state is saying that's the district as a whole. You, you as a district need to figure out how to achieve that. Hmm. And it has to be on this residential standard. And we have to include... Um, commercial, industrial, all of those things. So if you were a district with a Budweiser plant that didn't want to produce any less beer than it did last year or in 2013, all the residents of that area have to make up the entire 36% if that's in fact what they were asked to achieve. Um, there's things in here about ag. We don't have the percentage of ag to exclude ag. Um, so in our world, that's something that's their water use is thrown into the mix when we calculate this um, reduction. Um, you've got cities at the top of the page. Uh, this is just an interesting observation. You have some cities with 40 and 50 gallons per capita per day that are being required to conserve an additional 8%. But you also have the state in a whole nother proceeding saying that the health and safety minimum for people is 50 gallons per person per day but they didn't bring that over to their their logic at all um you've got there was arguments like san diego i think it's san diego county water authority has spent millions of dollars on a desalination plant that has gone online since 2013 so they asked the question that water doesn't count right, right. we get to use that and the state <clears> said no, you still need to achieve a reduction from 2013. So to put it in our context, <coughs> back many years ago, when I'm, since I've been here, I've been searching for a drought supply. So I went over to um, PG&E, and I think the Miocene Canal was a great drought supply. It's quanti good quantity of water, it's quality, its biggest problem is pumping. But if they would have said, oh, We'd love to sell you water, and within a year we had a deal, and by now we had spent $5 million to build a pumping plant, we, we'd, we'd still be required to cut 36% because they don't care. So right. those are currently. Right. Well, that, I, that's one I'm predicting is going to change, but um, that just goes to show you this is highly politicized. 
So you kind of throw logic out of the window when it becomes this politicized. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I got out of that meeting that I was relating to you that I attended. And there's other things I didn't remember to give on it, but I gave the key points of it. But some of those public health officials, you know, they were presenting all kinds of people, were saying that that 50 gallons is pretty difficult to meet per person, you know. Hmm. You might stand a chance if a person doesn't even have any potted plants, but they, uh, they said that way. Well, look at the list there. Those are all coastal communities, yeah. highly urbanized. Yeah. San Francisco, they don't have <laughs> yards. They have oh, skyscrapers, right. <laughs> and then they have parks. Yeah. And they take parks out of the equation. Yeah. So it's, it's inherently unfair. The state's already acknowledged it's unfair, yet they're adhering to this unfair standard. You know, we because have. The governor told them to. <laughs> well, the governor didn't tell them to use RGPCD, right? right? But they feel like they're handcuffed on that. Well, but well, you know, other than for you and us writing a letter, but a letter with your background and legalities of it, that's the other thing. A lawsuit. Well, the lawsuit work on something like this. Well, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that in closed session, so okay. I don't want to. <clears throat> reveal too much but again overall <laughs> strategy um, we're at the point where we're trying to shape the final product so we have a set of comments that are due today um, are do they have they not they don't have that in front of them no they don't okay um, I can kind of walk through those if you like um, then you know in, in about a week or so we're gonna see the kind of final staff product It'll then be forwarded to the water board itself, and then they'll meet on it May 5th or 6th. Um, so we still have <clears throat> some time to try to shape the final product. You, you know, a perfect example of, you know, there's many examples of unfairness here, but the, the district and its customers saved 21% last year. That 21%, however many gallons that represents or acre feet, is currently in our reservoirs. And the state's saying that's not available to you. It's no different than the desalination example. Well, we can serve last year to prepare for this year, and the state's saying you can only use 64% of it. It's crazy. it's crazy. When I looked at most of these percent saved, didn't we get an earlier version of this that was missing the last two columns than that? I don't know. Okay. Are you sent a, is this the what you sent, Georgiana? What you have on your desk. You sent it to e by email? Correct. That's Okay, so maybe a couple of columns were cut off just on my screen. But when I looked down to the percent saved, anybody that was close to us and the percent saved wasn't even close to the amount of production, except for El Dorado, I think, was the only one that I spotted that was even close to our amount of production. And their area is humongous, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. from what they service. So, and then you look at a place like uh, East Palo Alto, that was negative 11 percent <laughs> on there they actually used 45,000 gallons more than they did in 2013 but yet they're in the 10 percent standard they're in tier one they don't take showers down yeah, here we save 20, <laughs> we save 21 percent and produce a, a load of water per day well, and we it's just the reverse opposite and, thing. and while the, and you cut me off I'm sorry. If it, no, I'm saying cut me off if you feel the need oh, to. Okay. <laughs> but no, no, you didn't. I want you to cut them off. Here's where I sit as a recommendation where we're headed. In in this, so the public kind of knows at least where I sit, and the board's got the final say. We're going to stick with the regulations the board already adopted. That's what I'll recommend. We have. Uh, we'll put in a, a little more effort and outreach. Uh, the county's helping us with an event um, first week of May um, up at the um, Kmart parking lot. We'll continue to do outreach with our, our newsletter. Um, we'll continue to work, but we're not going to trumpet the need for the 36% because we're close to achieving it. Um, Here's where I think we'll target. I've been doing work on our rates, and part of the rates is analyzing the usage of the customers. So I don't know if this will get big enough. But this is in 2014, okay? So right here in the middle, 
the 40, this is all ranked by usage of our customers. So these are our low use customers, the lowest 20% of users um, annually, probably our A rate customers. This is, those are units of water per month. Good, good question. So these are the units, because I'm working on rates, so that's what we look at. These are the number of units they use on average per month. And then the next 20% is here, and this is the middle of the road. So this is our average kind of middle customer. This is averaging everybody. But if you look down here, our top 20 highest users of water in the district in 2014 used 47% of the water. So there'll be some form of outreach to those customers specifically, not a you're an evil customer, but a, hey, did you know you're one of our highest users? How can we help you um, cut down your use? Can we do a survey for you? Can, can, can we help you adjust your timers? Um, what, what, let us take a look at your use and help you fine tune it and kind of let them know that, We've, we're under a, an edict to cut back 36%, and you guys are our biggest way of being able to achieve that. Between that, I've got meetings I'll be setting up. Um, the dates aren't set, but I've talked to Parks and Recreation District. I've got a meeting with the um, Feather River Hospital to discuss their water use situation. Uh, the town's interested in talking to us, and I will set up a meeting with school district so we'll kind of hit those, and, and most definitely um, the, our ag customers and try and pull a meeting with them to see what um, they can do for us because they enjoy a lower rate. This is when we want to ask them, hey, how can you help us? What, what can you do to, to cut back? Um, so that's, that's my proposed plan rather than, you know, because what happens is those people that care a lot, I shouldn't say care a lot, those people that already conserve are going to be fighting to try and get to 36%, but that's not really where we need to target. Yeah, Bill? Um, in the newspaper they had about that lawsuit where the two districts or three districts involved had their highest users, they'd raise the rates very high. So we're not, I just want to make sure people understood, we're not in that position. We've done the opposite here. The highest users actually get a lower rate. And... Well, our, our highest residential, these are residential. Oh, okay. They, they do climb up into those higher tiers. Yeah, but it wasn't fun. Those rates, what, how long has it been? Two years since we did a rate increase? Yeah, but we've had tiers for 16 years at least. Yeah, but I, what I'm trying to say is that we're probably not going to be affected by that lawsuit. Yeah, I, I won't. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, that's my legal report. <laughs> yeah. I can give it now. Uh, that, that case came out Monday. It's receiving a lot of uh, attention, obviously. I think I've only read it once and quickly at that. So let me preface my comment with that. But I think there's a, there's a little bit of an overreaction. The press doesn't quite have it right. I think the agencies will still have the ability to use conservation pricing should the um, Proposition 218 process ultimately end in the customers allowing that. Um, so I'm going to write a, uh, it'll likely be a privileged letter that the uh, board members and staff will see on uh, my review of that case. But the short answer is I, we're going to be fine. I think we'll be able to continue doing um, what we've been doing and maybe even a little bit more in the future um, to ensure that uh, we have prices that encourage conservation. Is there a way for a customer to call in and see where they're at since you have this data? Is this like via Aquahawk? Would it say you're in the top 40% of, I've never used that feature, so I don't know. I, or can they call it, into the district and say? I don't think it's something Aquahawk calculates automatically, like I know, yeah. but it's probably something they can do for us. Um, they've been very helpful. They've started, you know, some of these regulations they've really helped us with. We had a, a um, 
shortage of help in the office, Aquahop stepped up and they were able to do all of our notification for even customers that aren't on Aquahop. Um, Very nice. And so they've already contacted us, said, how can we help? You know, we're here to help you formulate reports, um, step up our, our leak notification to customers if we need to. There's a lot of things they can do to help us meet some of these rules. And that may be one of them. Um, well, just like you know that the top 20% of users use 46% of the water, 47% of the water, you know who those 20% people are. I do. And we have that data. And okay. I can extract... So can a customer call in and say, am I in the, am I one of the 20 percenters? Um, they, I mean, it shouldn't be hard to spot their yard. You know, I mean, that, well, it, quite honestly, I mean, if you're using yeah, that much water, it's a your lab, yard's going to look like it's something. It's a so. list I developed with all the data. So right now, no, they couldn't. Okay. But when we generate the list and we work with our CR consultant, okay. generate a letter telling them that they are, they'll know. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, I was just wondering if there's people that, I mean, news is going to get around quickly, that this is going to be something that happens. And so if someone wanted to be proactive on it, there, could they it. call in and say, am I in that, you know, in that tier and I want to do something now? Not likely, but since they were happy to use 47% of the water last year, it's <laughs> not likely they're going to be the proactive on it. But I was just wondering if there's anything in place yet. Nope. Not, not in those realms. I'll save my phone call then. So at, at this particular time, I think I'll go to public. And uh, there were some people who wanted to make comments. Would you go yeah, ahead? I wanted to answer uh, Seth real quick because uh, I just did that today. So. My name's just so you can get the, the calculation. I, well, I called in uh, to Mickey, who does the Aquahawk magic. Um, Name and address. It's a great system, but... Sorry? Oni Carroll, he said already. Yeah, I said, he said already. I'm sorry. I'll do it again. Oni Carroll. I know who you are, yeah. Uh, who are you? are Seth, yeah. right. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So, um, anyway, I talked to her for a little while. Um, George wanted to use me as a guinea pig a bit uh, to see just how easy this system was to, to get the information out. It's not easy. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in it. It's a great database. But um, the comment that I made back to Mickey was, if you look at PG&E's website, and they've got a, you know, my usage portion of that, it's real simple. It's, you know, numbers that, that you need to know. There's a lot of stuff in Aquahawk that most people don't need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, day-to-day, -day, all these graphs and so forth. So um, I said, well, how can I learn better how to use this system? Of course, she's... Uh, did some tricks and stuff right there on the phone with me and there was a click here and oh it's in gallons you know that's one of the bigger issues we've got here we've got units we've got gallons and everybody you know is all over the place so they don't know what's going on where are we as far as t the, our targets go individually and I think that's where we need to go with this George I think you're right as far as you know addressing this on a human basis, I'll put it that way. Um, the, the 20 percentile there that are using more than 50% of the water, I think I wager that if you put them in tier 100 and they had to pay gazillion dollars uh, uh, you know, for their water, they'd still do it. It's not that. Um, we've got a broken system. Uh, one that's based on economics, and it's really something that should be based more on moral issues than anything. So um, I think you're right on as far as your approach goes. Um, the question I had, too, was 36% of what? What are we basing that on? 2013. Okay, so... But, but just June through June February. Through September. Oh, is it June through February? Something like that. It's not the full calendar year. It's a portion of it. So they have 266 gallons per person per day. Is that 2013? 14? Those are 2013 numbers. 
2013 is the baseline. Oh, yeah. No, that's 2014 number. Then they looked at, they used 2014. So here's a big... They initially used one month in 2014. In the revision, they used the average of June through September of 2014. So to add more confusion to this picture, yeah. they created a number that you have no clue what you're looking at, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, maybe there's some of you that figured that out. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you can all see, this is, this is paradise. This is PID. So we're doing a summer, great job. We hit at 315. Right, and we should have been doing a poor job because it bit us in the you-know-what. Yeah, because we would have been 36% right. of 410. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying go there, but that's what happened with this regulation. And we can sit here and go, you know, it's unfair, terrible, you know, you, you did this wrong, did that wrong, but at the end of the day, we're going to have to find some water to conserve. Uh, Dustin, are we going to be held to this standard even though we're doing litigation? The litigation on what? On the well, I mean, these, the fairness of these. Uh... Oh, um, well, the, you know, the board hasn't decided anything on litigation yet, so let me okay. make that clear. But, but in, the, in, the, in, the lit what? in the legal realm, while we're trying to figure this stuff out and they go into action on June 1st, are we gonna be held to those numbers? I think um, if you make a good faith attempt, which we're gonna do that, we, we wanna conserve. I don't know that we need to conserve 36%, given all the reasons we've discussed already, but... Um, well, what if we don't? Well, what if we don't? Then if you make a good faith attempt, I think the water board's gonna have a really difficult time um, imposing any kind of fines. But theoretically, the Water Board can come at this district and impose, try to impose penalties. And You only made 35. They technically yeah, could. They technically yeah. Could. So it's $10,000 a day. Yep, up to. And uh, they could call it a non-authorized diversion. <laughs> I mean, so they could tack on other things as well, but right. $10,000 a day. And, you know, I've even thought just treat this as a business decision. I don't know, Kevin, if 36% of 315, if we pencil that out, if, if it makes more sense for customers to use as they did last year, for example, then this, is 36% of our summer consumption more than $10,000 $10, in revenue? I don't know, but, um, you know, it's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and revenue is going to go down as we conserve. So, you know, there's there's that issue as well. Uh, you know, your revenue is going away and the water is going away. So, you know, we've got big issues. In any case, I, I'm, I'm proposing we um, focus on ways to reduce the water. Um, George, I think you're on the right track. So... With that, I'll see you. Good Thank luck. you. Thank you, Oni. <clears throat> By the way, just so the public understands, I probably should have made this a little more clear. Uh, this is an open session as opposed to public comments, so it's not going to be quite so uh, restrictive in regard to you engaging in questions as happened. And that's why we're allowing that to happen in this topic. Uh, it's it's uh, like when we have open sessions uh, for uh, rate meetings will have a lot of the same type dialogue coming back because uh, we need this input to help us make our decision and, and that's, that's what we're allowing. Any, but any other public comments? Lauren? Thank you, Lauren Harvey. Um, I agree with George. I, I, you know, I seldom do, I must say, but I, but I, when I drive over on Valley View, up there on Valley Ridge and stuff, and I see those nice houses, those guys, I, I'm not begrudging them because America's built on, on, on if I work hard, I get more money. I don't have a problem with that. But, but in a time of need, you've got those people up there, they could pay anything they want, much as George could, by the way. But, but, uh, but the thing is, 
they're not going to conserve. I, I drove by there and seen actual little uh, rock streams running around people's houses with water in it. You know what I mean there? So I, I don't know what the situation would be, but uh, I, I feel that it's, I, I want to rise and say that I feel that it's fair we go after that 46% because I just fortunately just got my bill and I'm back down to $27, $28 again. So I made one month last year that was a little over, so I got burned for it, but I'm back down again. And there ain't no way, I'm not going to leave the yellow water in my bathroom to save another 36%. I can tell you that, folks, it's not going to happen because I, I'm already at the bottom, you know. So we're going to have to try to get those massive users, especially in this time of need. But the other question the other thing I think is when you go into private session and you're talking about are we going to sue the shorts out of California or not, I, I feel like you, you should be able to make some sort of legal argument. We have 19 months worth of water whether it rains or not because of the way we've already conserved and it's sort of stupid to make a district save more when they've already got more than enough to make it now. Now if it goes on through and next year it looks kind of bad, then I say, hey, we're all going to have to tighten up even tighter, but, I, you know, so I think go after the 46%. I, it, I, don't, I don't mean go after them like beat them or nothing like that, but I think we ought to notify them, hey, you're the 46, you're the 20% that uses 46% of the water. How'd you like to help us out some? You know, I think that's only fair. You ought to be rifling them off all a letter today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> When I travel down the valley and the people, the comment I get back is, uh, you know, that canal out there hasn't gone down a bit. The one that's taking all the water to Southern California, it's still riding along at the same level. And they said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, Southern California has all those votes and San Francisco has all those votes. This is just, agree with Dustin, this is politics, boys. Any other members from the public would have questions or would like to make comments? Anything else from the board on this? Hmm. I have a question in regard to the, uh, the gallons per day measure per person per day. Uh, is it, where do they get their number of people from? Was that from the last census? Yes. So if we uh, if we trucked in ten thousand people, <laughs> could we could do a quick population count? And uh, yeah, you have to help your mortgage business. A that's bit. what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a win-win for Ken on that one. So. <laughs> Okay, anything else from the board members? Thank you very much. Then we'll close that open session and moving back into our agenda, general manager's report. All right, you don't have my written report because <laughs> I was on vacation last week. Um, so I'll give you an update. Here's our water level, Paradise Reservoir. Uh, we're down 5.3 feet from spill. So um, we are... Above last water, year, Emily, just up a little bit. Um, we've kind of flattened out, but we could get a May storm that keeps moving it up. I mean, it doesn't. This isn't the, the end of it. it. up a little bit. Yeah, it but did. We're not drafting like yet. Two feet. Uh, we we just started. We just started pulling Monday because of water quality issues. Yeah. If you go to, you know, part of the reason it's up also is you go to the total storage that gaps a little closer you can't probably tell that but we've been drawing on Miguelia for months um, to draw that storage down because if we need it at the end of the year it's going to be really unpleasant so we tried to use it while it was usable and now we just switched um, here we are we're 80 86 percent of average storage um, 1700 acre feet lower than average and 85 percent of total still percentage wise we still have, this data didn't change, 19 months of supply remaining uh, in our reservoirs if we didn't get any more rain. Um, and you saw that one already. Uh, there was, I think that the other one I was going to show you already did with the uh, <clears throat> work I'm doing on the rates, which 
got a definite curveball, so we'll have to wait a little bit for Dustin's opinion on that rate case before I can go back to the drawing board and, and reassess that sum. Um, oh, there was another thing I want to talk about. Um, grant, if you remember, we applied for the um, conservation grant, and that data is on your table uh, for the board members, but um, this is the full one. We so just, We were just six down from... We were ranked sixth. Are in the sixth ranking. That's not going to work. Can you zoom that in? Yep. We were in the sixth ranking. They funded through five. Oh no! So we just missed it. Um, I'm, I'll be working tomorrow on a comment letter, another comment letter to the state. Um, when the governor made his proclamation, there was money that he specifically directed towards um, this water energy grant program. And so they're accepting comments on how to deal with that. If they were to just take that money and save the process of going through this all over again and just fund the next level, we get funded. That is a good idea, George. That and that's what my letter's going to say. It's really simple. No staff time. You just yeah, dig a little deeper. You've been it. through the effort. And you hopefully, know. with any hope, they will. And... Um, uh, I, I still want to commend um, our, our grant writer, Silvar Consulting. Uh, there's no way after going through this process with her and working with her um, daily for a while towards the end, um, we would not have ranked this high without her assistance. And we spent uh, about $8,000, I think, eight to 10000 with her help on that. So um, still, still holding out hope that um, they just reach a little deeper and we get funded. Um, Elliott Road is, is now fixed. I don't know if you saw that in the news. Uh, we were kind of a newsworthy item with a, a pretty good sized leak there on Elliott Road. Um, I was asked to, to speak to them a little bit. It was a very difficult repair. I want to again thank South Feather Water and Power. Our, our welder was on vacation. Um, we needed um, some fittings uh, put together to be able to fix that. You had a, a pipeline coming here and then it was diving down at a 45 and going under a storm drain and it leaked on one of the uh, 45s. So they had to um, build these um, fittings to be able to connect the old pipe to the, the newer pipe and recreate that whole um, 45 degree assembly and then tie it back in. We did have a small leak after that it happened a little further up. So we went back in, I think the week later, and we grabbed a little more pipe and got that taken care of. So it's all buttoned up. I think the hydrant run's done now. The, the town helped us, allowing us to put spoils on the uh, right, the walkway right away got that cleaned up um, so just so you know it should be good to go for a while um, we Jim and I uh, a lot of Jim have been working with the Department of Boating and Waterways um, staff on our boat ramp uh, grant possibility um, they had a they had a shake up since this, not a shake up, a change since this process started and Department of Boating and Waterways fell, got moved under the Department of Parks and Recreation. So we're kind of dealing with new people through this process. Um, and they've been out on the site. They're still supportive of the project. We have a schedule neck, uh, I forget the dates, but we're going to uh, walk the project site with the um, commissioners that in the old realm, those commissioners actually approved of the project or not. And in the new realm, uh, staff makes a recommendation for approval. This commission listens to the project and accepts public input, but they don't really make the decision. The department makes the decision. So that's a good thing, but we've also had some other curveballs um, we have got a meeting with field meet with Sierra Pacific Institute on the easement. We're still working on that. Um, we're still trying to hopefully get 
the state to be okay with a gravel road. Today we got an email that when is the when would the entry road on the easement, when would you get the easement and when would the road be paved for that easement? So we need to work through that because SBI is selling that property. So we were trying to just put in a gravel easement now. So whoever the new buyer was, if they wanted our access to be somewhere else, we would work with them on that. Um, so we are close to um, that meeting happening and Hoping for approval, looks very positive. Then we'll have to the end of the year to secure the easement and kind of wrap up all the details. So um, it's looking, still looking very positive. Just a few hiccups along the way. George? Yes. When we had the lake, it was a lake committee, and the fellow was here from Sierra Pacific. Uh, Kieran? The fellow that Doug got on the board. He was said he'd be very helpful and try to get us that He's and he been, has been. He's been oh, very good. helpful. Yes. Is that Karen O'Leary? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got an update on Kids Fishing Day by the committee. Um, fuels reduction grant. Guy talked to Callie Jane um, Deandra now today. Uh, they got some money from PG&E to do some more fuels reduction. We're going to do a field meet uh, first week of May uh, and try and accomplish some more clearing through a grant um, on the, in this area right up here. So we've done a little work down here and we're going to try and keep expanding on that work on this side of the reservoir. Um, so we're doing a field meet. We'll get some input on that. You can expect an, an MOU uh, between Fire Safe Council and us at the next board meeting, uh, and you can decide if we want to proceed with that. Um, it's a short, short-term grant, and so we, I'm still waiting for the field meet to get Greg's comfort level because it's gonna to have to be done during fire season. We've done it before with specific protocols of no work on red flag days and other days we only do certain work. Um, but I wanna make sure he's comfortable with it before I even recommend to you that we proceed. Um, be, just because it's gonna to have to happen during that season and we're not super happy to do that then. Um, last thing I have to report is the U.S. Forest Service, you'll recall that we have a dam in our recreation facilities under a permit from the U.S. Forest Service. Um, we've worked with them in the past uh, without any problems. We worked with th whoever their representative was when we built the gazebo. Uh, it's now under the control of a new person uh, and the permit is up for renewal. So Jim and I are working with that person to um, hopefully not have to re-engineer the gazebo and stamp it and <coughs> submit that because we think we got approval, but they don't have a track record of it. Um, we may have to do some ADA improvements to the gazebo because of the new Forest Service permit. Um, we're also working with them on the opening of the lake year round. They thought we should have consulted them, yet their lands were open year round. So we're trying to work through all of these issues. And, and in the end point is a new five year, I think, operating permit. I think it goes five years, but I'm not sure. I mean, hopefully 10 <laughs> through what we're going through. So where's, we're- Where's the title? Where's their title? Where do we have title and where do they? They have title under our, of Everything. the dam, the wreck area. All, basically they have a swath that goes right through here and parts of this land. And then they have a little swath over here. Mm -hmm. um, so all of our main facilities at the lake are on under permit by them. Okay. Would they tell us to take Would our dam required... and go away? <laughs> I don't know. But... It wasn't it required when the original build of the dam to have recreational facilities there? 
That was part of the Davis Grunsky grant. Part of the funding. Yeah, I was going to say so. But that. Yeah. Is, who supersedes who and who? Well, I mean, it's not that they're going to pull our permit, but they're going to make us do some stuff, probably. They, they want money. To get up to up to speed. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. All right. That's thank all you. I can think of. <clears throat> thank you, George. Have we got all of our legal report presented? Uh, unless there's questions, I, I, I should mention, I didn't get a chance to tell George this today. Looks like uh, Term 91 curtailment, maybe even tomorrow. Uh, the district's uh, most junior post-1914 water right is subject to Term 91. Not a big deal from operations standpoint. Um, but post-1914 curtailments, which um, the district has two of, one with Term 91, the other without, uh, post-1914 curtailments will likely be May 1. Depends on if we get some rain between now and then. Um, and then the Water Board is really adamant. They're talking about uh, pre-1914 curtailments. Um, too. So if we haven't um, done that yet, we need to finish our review of... Yeah, we're trying to figure out the date of our pre-1914, and it's quite a quest into the 1800s that we're trying to find. So, it, it, yeah. The but date you of first said use. May 1st for post-1914, so we're not going to get to keep May storms, technically. Not unless they lift. Yeah, which they did lift once last year in the fall. The, the water board is much more aggressive this year on curtailments and indicating how deep they'll go into the water right priority system. They're even talking some riparian curtailments. Um, so we'll see if they do it. But by the way, there are legal arguments for why they can't do that. Of course. <laughs> just promise that we'll give it all back. If they just let us keep it, we'll give yeah. it all back. We yep, promise. As soon as our, <laughs> we're just holding it for you until yeah, exactly. the reservoir spills yeah. over. Then you can have it. <laughs> uh, I, I told Ken I have a couple of questions. If you're aware, I brought this up over the time and even before I was on the board, it was on the public. Uh, we we have a contract with the planning source D, no, and it's for $306,430. And we paid them 200000 plus. We still owe them 100 water. We got remaining that they're going to build us for, and I really appreciate Kevin the way you're doing this now because it's easy to pick out. But we're the, not in the, the financial the, report yet. Huh? We're not in. Oh, no, he's talking about water rights. And what I'm wondering. Oh. That's what he's talking about water rights. Okay, I, thought you were, I was trying to figure out where you were going with that. Yeah, yeah water rights. Well, reference how what much, you're looking at we, so we can much, find it. How much have we paid this company or other companies just to verify our? water rights, pre-1914, 14, whatever it was, that they put in when they put the district together. It's in Kevin's report. He, uh, oh, he you haven't a, paid. De Novo didn't kind of do that. iPad, work. page 88. Yeah. De Novo's just d yeah, doing the environmental paper. analysis on renewing the permits. They haven't done an, an examination of the pre-1914 water rights. Yeah, in other words, we, we've paid them $204,000, and we haven't got the square one. No. No, you've well, got, we've gotten way past square one. <laughs> yeah, you've got biological studies. I mean, you, you've you almost got a final product. It just needs okay. some final editing. And we got $101,000 yet to go. Yeah. So maybe when we get close to 101000 they figure it's all, they will, they'll settle or whatever. Oh, no, no. They're waiting for us. This has nothing to do with De Novo. What we put it? them on hold because we were trying to get... Uh, an agreement with Water Rights Board staff on all of our calculations. Yeah. And we're not, let me finish, we're not getting a response to that. Yeah. So uh, De Novo is waiting for us to give them the green light to start up again. We've held off waiting for those comments. I'm about ready to kind of work with Dustin and just plow ahead, but we haven't had that conversation because he doesn't even get to sleep anymore with all this stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, the, the, whole point, the whole point that I wanted to make as a taxpayer and a rate payer, I started looking at this, you know, before I was elected to the board. That seems like a horrible thing to impose on someone that's had the damn things for a hundred years. What are we doing different? 
that they did a hundred years ago when they formed the thing at first built the dam. The Gator Reservoir. Yeah, I don't well, know why welcome, we have Welcome name. to California, Doug. The cost, I realize it's California. Yeah. The cost of the half a million bucks to prove that we're still doing what we did a hundred years ago. Yeah, that's a but fair better. that's a fair criticism. But better. But I don't know why it'd be an interesting case study maybe for a future intern. Why the district didn't take that 1916 right to license sometime over the last 99 years. Um, it's the oldest in the state. <laughs> they were waiting for George. So, yeah, uh, it's odd. The, the more junior post-14 water right the district has, that makes sense. We're not quite at a point to go to license on that one. Well, you see, it looks like to me, and I've mentioned this before here in other places, that's the thing that we need to get our politicians involved in. Because they're the ones that set the rules and make the laws, not the water board. But the water, when I just listened to this strategic thing, they were just going along and they primed old good old Governor Brown what to say and brought it down on us. You know, they, they're the ones that primed them all the way. Well, unless you can get a politician to exempt water rights proceedings from CEQA, because that's what we're paying for, it's CEQA. The CEQA process is costing all the money. That's why we have to do it. And, and yeah, you're right. That decision that they require CEQA was in 95 or something like that, that, that the state just decided they had to have CEQA. So if some point in the 80s we went to license, it would have cost yeah. the district $10,000 of legal fees. And, and we could have done it. It, it would be done. fine. It would be... Yeah, we'd have it licensed right no, now. It, no one would contest packet, it. We got an exceptionally nice letter from Sullivan Gallagher, who I know quite well, as a matter of fact. Instead of doing that, he should say, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and I'm going to call those people in the water board outfit all kinds of bad names to threaten to fire their butt if they don't get something done properly. And they have the power to do that. And Jim Nielsen is sure as hell go along. I know both those people. But anyway, by the way, just the greasy wheel gets the grease. You're a squeaky wheel. Squeaky wheel. Thank That's you. right. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, do we do we try things like that? Are these letters that we send to the uh, to the water board? Do we copy in Gallagher and Nielsen and our local local politicians up here and just kind of keep them informed of what we're thinking and the troubles we're having? Um, James Gallagher is pretty aware. He's up to date. I gave a speech um, at the joint Richfield Irrigation District and Western Canal Water District meeting, and he was there. So I think we haven't had an issue where I've had to CC our respective representatives, but that does happen on occasion. So it's, that's, that's a tool that we have available to us. We, I don't recall us ever using that, or at least not in recent memory. No, we don't normally. Well, uh, it seems to me, I've talked to uh, James Gallagher several times uh, recently, and it seems like he's <coughs> looking for things to do. And they're always off at, you know, offering, oh, my door's always open, come in, bring your stuff to me, let us know what's going on, how can we possibly help you? So maybe we uh, ought to tell him, we want water rights. Uh, he's been at three water meetings that I've gone to, the one just recently down at Chico. And then this strategic one I gave a report on. And, uh, he is really into it, you know. And, uh, well, yeah. that's his former profession. He worked for uh, Tim Kelleher, Rice Lawyers. So, big users. Yeah. <laughs> well, you people are going to make all the money. The rest, the rest of us are going to state and grow. <laughs> you guys are going to make all the dollars out of this thing. <laughs> and earn every penny of it, I might add, Dustin. Yeah. <laughs> Dustin's feeling good about that. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's right in the class with well drawers right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we've got our general manager's report and our legal report, staff and billing reports. Reser uh, review and consider acceptance of those. On the attorney alert. Um, how about we just see if we have any interest? Does anybody have any? The only thing is what you just passed you was to uh, bring up. Like, Bill, did you have any any particular items in there you wanted to question or ask about? No, we spent all my time on the other stuff. The sales. I just want to, oops. Again? I want to point out, just a minute. Bill, this is for you. Oh. No, so, he wants pipeline. Well, 
pipeline is there Dr. and Bill. there and there. But Bill asked specifically last month about fireflies. So you'll see this chart in the reports going forward. Just wanted to point that out. So as you're getting the new fireflies that don't have battery problems, you're replacing the other ones. Is that it? These are battery problem replacements. So 44 in January, 44 in February, <clears throat> 41 in March. Okay. Thank you. Now I've noticed you used firefly colors there for the uh, chart, the graph. I didn't oh. do the chart. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> and you wanted the lake? Did we miss the lake? Thank you very much, Tom. Lake looked amazing. I don't know what the reason is for that. Uh, where'd it go? <clears throat> Coming up. Oh, I can tell you, it's because the lake opened early. No. That's why. So, pay it. so that yellow will take part of the green more than likely. That would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if it's, 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 they're all even. I'm hoping it doesn't, because if that stays on even. track with that, that'll yeah. send it through the roof. Well, you can see the growth in 2015. But I don't know why they have the half. Oh. <laughs> the use of the lake. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Why do you have half the firefly on the graph? It's just the way that the graph is <laughs> done. Well, we I'll talk to Mickey to make it single digits. <laughs> Help we, Keith. We give you a graph and then you're going to pick it apart. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought maybe they could replace half of it. Graph to any other, any other no graph to a graph. Any other questions to bring up? Okay. Larry, anything for Nothing you in for regard me. to staff and billing reports? Seth? I was good. That's what I just wanted to point that out, but I attribute it to the same thing early opening of the lake. Okay, I'm ready for a I motion. I move we accept the staff and billing re reports as submitted. I'll second. So moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. We will move on to treasurer's report. Okay, hey, man. Maybe we'll accept this. <laughs> you have my written report. Uh, currently, the district's cash position is $3.5 million. Um, we've made uh, almost all of our debt service payments for the year, so there shouldn't be any more larger payments coming out. Our consumption is obviously down, so our consumption <clears throat> revenue is down about $350,000 for the fiscal year. Um, so we're going to have to really take that in consideration. Our next budget year, which I've already started uh, for, uh, formatting. I've already made a request to all the managers to kind of keep their capital down this next fiscal year, their capital requests, uh, until we do get a little more cash flush or cash coming in. And also we have been really looking at rates. George has been really crunching the rates, looking at ways that we can uh, structure the rates as there was a court case that threw out tiered rates for a specific organization or uh, district out there. So we're really having to now kind of go back to the drawing board to justify tiered rates. And so we're really kind of looking at that on how we can make sure that we can make rates so that we can promote conservation but stay within the legal requirements of Prop 218. Uh, what's the difference here in the cash from a year ago on this chart you have up the cash position? <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I have to take a guess, but I think it's approximately 250000 down from where it was. We normally fluctuate between 3.2 and 4.2, and this is just down, dipping down to the Okay, so your $3,539,000 last year at this time would be an over $4 million. Or about 3.8, I would say. 3.8? Yeah. Now, have we, where did the loss in income on the water show up? How did it show up? Right time down. How, how did it show up? Yeah. Uh, like, what, what is our loss? Yeah, I thought one time you told us we were going to lose uh, half a million dollars. We were projecting that. Um, but if you look here, right now, our... We're down based on our budgeted actual budget versus actual three hundred forty nine thousand uh, seventy two dollars or and seventy two dollars. So what you can see is though is our lower months we're actually 
we're right on. So if you look at February, we actually were $2,000 over projection. If you look at March, we were another 3,000, we were about $2,000 over projection. So I'm assuming the next couple months will be right on budget. So the real big losses you can see are um, in September and October, October November. November, and then yeah. slightly in December, and then January was, was way down. Um, I think we got a lot of rain that in January that everybody's just gonna shut it off. December is not rain. So, so, but you can see that it's kind of flattened out. So I would say that our, our loss or our variance between budget and actual is about, this probably will stay about $350,000 for this current fiscal year. Thank you. And we'll take, we'll take that into consideration when we're budgeting the next year based on not maybe a three-year average of what we've done in the past, but maybe just what's happened just last drought, year. A drought average. And what's required from us this year, so going forward. So we'll have to really take that into consideration and we'll figure out. It, it's also going to be a big part of the rate evaluation, because if you go back to 76, 77, the district was climbing in water use, and then we hit the drought, and it took, I believe, seven years to get back to the pre-drought usage by our customers. Seven years. I think, I think it was seven years. So. In other words, they didn't replant real quick. Is what you're right. Yep. Yeah. So this, this could be a, a long-term type of thought process that you know, we remember the district's pretty fixed charged, so we have to pay our bills, which means we're going to have to go out to our customers even though there's conservation out there, less water usage, there still needs to be revenue coming in. And so that's, that's a really always a tough decision saying, sorry, we understand you can serve, we know you cut back, but we need money from you still. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Um, and that's going to be part of the rate rate committee and rate rate hearing that we'll be looking at is and that's pretty easy to justify hey you got bills we need to pay them we got to get money and that's pretty easy it's just how we structure that is what comes into the consideration of what's going on so um, we well, i know you're going to be looking at it but uh the district like ours our assurative cash flow is a service fee Right now we're 7525 75% um, 75 of our income is. Yeah, but that also is counterintuitive to conservation. So. And, you, and, you, and what I'm doing is looking at that. That's why I have that spreadsheet of numbers. That's only a little piece of an entire spreadsheet because you don't just have the fixed charge. You also have, you know what they're going to use in-house day in and day out. So even though that's consumption side, it's still pretty guaranteed income because Everybody's got to use a certain amount of water. And then uh, on the consent calendar, you saw that we uh, selected the same auditing firm that we've had the last three years. They were the low bidder <coughs> uh, by a significant portion. And so we will be having them for the next three fiscal years. And then if you remember, our policy is then we cannot select them for the next, fis next three fiscal years. So we'll have to exclude them from bidding next time. I'll answer any questions. If any. Because of the drought, maybe we might change that policy, huh? Can we? Or it can change any policy. We're not required. We not, there's no state law that says no. we have to. No, but we would, districts. we'd recommend against it anyhow. It's, it goes back to uh, uh, our commitment to transparency. Mm -hmm. It's just, you don't, it's just a good thing to have another set of eyes look at everything. Yeah. I've been real happy with them, but yeah. Oh yeah, they're excellent. Be time for a move. I'll make a motion to accept the treasurer's report as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Did you have another item? No, I, was, I was just going to ask uh, on this auditing firm for 1415 through 1670, is that the same auditing firm we've been having? Is it, is it yeah. same? For the last three years, that's correct. Right. Right. Tittle and Co. Co. out of Chico. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Passes 5-0. And <clears throat> now we are going to 
uh, announced that we're going to move into a closed session conference with legal counsel and director's comments. I missed that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I did. Number 13. Unless you want to do them after the closed session. No, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, nobody's here. Right? We'll do it now. We want, <laughs> we want some audience. Transparency, right? Director's <laughs> comments. <laughs> Sep, we'll, we'll take you since you got that on the table. Okay. I just wanted to uh, thank the staff and everybody that helped out up there. Um, Kids Fishing Day, huge success again. Uh, so many smiling faces. Everybody um, on PID staff that was up there had uh, just, you know, great smiling faces and all the tents. It's early morning. It's, you know, they have a lot of prep and getting done. And Georgiana was up there and Jim Ladrini was pushing chili dogs like they were going out of style. So. Um, it was a, what's that? Yeah, Mark and Tanya were up there, yeah, doing pictures out there. And uh, Dutch Brothers, of course, doing their uh, donation thing and providing drinks for everybody. But everybody was having a really good time. I saw so many smiling faces. Fish were being caught left and right. Um, fortunately, we only got one, but they were being caught left and right of us. <laughs> so, uh, so now they got a couple right at dawn. Uh, little kid that caught like a three and a half pounder last year or somewhere close to that i think he was three then he's four this year and i think he caught about a two and a half pounder oh, no. this year it's like really you know he's you know he's got this little teeny like a three foot long pole that they cast <laughs> out there and you know out, out of the top three weights two of them were four-year-olds yeah 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 little kid and he's just sitting there just cranking this thing in you know and this like i said little three foot pole you know, here we've got we've got fifty dollars a pole invested in ours, and and uh, but it's the power bait. So, but no, everybody had a really really great time. I just wanted to thank everybody for what an excellent job, as usual, that they did up there. Um, it was a great event. Larry, uh, just I want uh, did get some have been getting some complaints about how low the water is in Magalia Reservoir. Of course, uh, it's probably people who don't live in the PID district that don't like it. And of course, they, they're they saying that we're sending it to Southern California and that's why it's low, which is not oh, true. <laughs> but do they always, you know, we're think the word. We're sent to Southern Paradise. Yeah. Conspiracy. <laughs> anyway, and uh, yeah, and uh, I, um, I know my son called me because on Facebook they were talking okay. about it and everything. And he, he wrote a little... PR thing about it, saying that no, it's it's being used here, and it's to help. And they also said that the reason we were doing it is just to keep the lake high for kids fishing day, <laughs> which had nothing to do with it. But they, it's really funny how these little rumors get started. And that's about all I have to say. Doug? Yes, I agree. So it was said that kids fishing day was just a wonderful experience for all of us and the. Little people there, the staff just did an awesome job. I mean, it's really a true PR thing that's just wonderful because it affects people out. And like Bill said earlier, he and I went up together and was on both sides of the lake. And then earlier in the month, I received a call just about dark from one of our rate payers who I happened, he happened to know, know me. And he had, was taking care of a piece of property. And the property that he was taking care of was fine except the neighbor in the middle of them had a broken pipe and it had actually flooded two yards plus the guy that had a broken pipe. And so he was trying to figure out what to do. And so I called uh, Jim Agrini and he gave me the standby number, which I have written down in here, but I called the guy on the standby and I had the uh, person who called me his phone number and I got the answering machine and in three minutes he had called back. He didn't know who I was, but which is good, you know, because of the fact that he jumped right on top of it and he had another thing that he was, another leak he was fixing that he had about 20 minutes. He showed up over there and fixed the leak and everybody was happy and that damn pipe would have ran there and flooded half the country if we hadn't been on top of that, you know. So what our standby person did, I don't even know who it was, but he was very nice over the phone. He didn't realize who I was. But anyway, uh, he shut the water off and told the guy that watched the property what he was going to do, and then he put a note on the door. You know. So it's great to have staff like that. Thank you. Bill? 
Oh, I want to report that my teeth aren't coated as much as they were a few days ago. It's finally gone down. See, I live at the bottom of the pipe. <laughs> uh, Neil, so I know, and I thought because of my mouth wasn't coated, they must have switched over to lake water instead of this, I call that the stinking <laughs> pond, the Megalia Reservoir. So you've done it just in time, and now I don't have to brush my teeth as hard. So. <laughs> okay. So you're sending the water to Southern Paradise. That's what, I That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> <clears throat> I have a comment. <clears throat> um, I didn't really pay attention to when the lake is closed or not, because the lake always seems like it's open, but I wanted to go up and see the lake after kids' fishing day. I wanted to see it on Sunday uh, to take a look and see what it means, 85 or 86%, because the last time I was out there, there were a million tree stumps all, out, all, all, out, all visible out there. So I drove up there and it was closed. And they had a barriers across the road and I took uh, Monica with me out there and we packed a little lunch and we were gonna walk around and take some pictures of the lake. So after thinking about that barrier for a little while, I said, well, I'm gonna go find out what's going on. I'll just, I'll just go ask Greg. So I got out and moved the barrier and drove inside, put the barrier back, drove on around. And uh, finally, I uh, rousted Greg out of his home and, and uh, I told him that I had, had come up to inspect the lake and the facilities after this kid's fishing day. And uh, I see the lake is closed. Is it all right if I can, can I still go out there? You know, I can hide, hide my car so nobody else will see because there were apparently a lot of people driving up and before me and after me. But he said, yeah, no problem, but park up here by my house and, and it won't, uh, create any visibility. So uh, we did that. We spent maybe, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half up there. Uh, walked out about a mile or a mile and a, a, mile and a quarter. Uh, took pictures of the lake. I was really happy to see it. Uh, you know, at, at 85, 86%, that looks like a happy lake, <laughs> especially compared to what we've seen over the last several years. And I wanted to pass a compliment along to Greg and our, our new lake assistant patrol guy, uh, Jason. Jason. It was hard for me to find any garbage around the entire area that we walked, about a mile and a quarter out and a mile and a quarter back and around the picnic area. They had that place cleaned up looking spick and span. I know Jason was still there. Uh, working because at one point Greg asked me if I'd move my car out of in front of away from the front of his truck so he could he could leave when he uh, when he got off uh, shift I guess uh, but those two guys did a very very nice job in cleaning that up and I passed that compliment along to Greg uh, before I left I was able to talk to him again before we we left with my pictures and and uh, uh, knowledge and input on the on the lake so that was uh, Perhaps we heard compliments about it being well executed. It was uh, sure a very good job in cleaning up the mess. Because I, I don't know how many hundreds of people go up there, but there's, there's a lot of people. Might be a good comment about our public also, the people that come up there and use that lake. Uh, it's, it's, their, it's their lake, it's their nest. Maybe they help take care of it and police their own garbage up to a great extent. Uh, Greg had mentioned something like that too. Uh, anyhow, that's the end. That's it for my comments. Now I'll announce the closed session that we're going to go into, and, and then we're going to retire into closed session. It's a conference with legal counsel uh, regarding anticipated litigation, initiation you. of litigation pursuant to paragraph four of subdivision D of the government code section four, whoops, five four nine five six point nine one potential case. And if you have the desire to hang around here for whenever we come out of closed session, we'll make an announcement as to whether we took any action or, or did not take any action. And uh, given that, we're going to we're going to go now. Go now. <laughs>